Okay, uh, it looks like we are back up again. Um, I'm going to monitor it more closely this time, and I apologize. Uh, I have absolutely no idea why this is happening. No idea at all. It's completely mysterious. It couldn't possibly be interference. Couldn't possibly have anything to do with the slides that I have, the topics that I'm talking about, or whether somebody doesn't want you to hear this or not. Couldn't have anything to do with that at all, obviously. This is very strange, too, because last time it turns out that I was able to stop the stream and then restart the stream with the same stream key. And this time I was not able to do that. That ability was removed. So I literally had to close my browser, close Wirecast, reopen my browser, reopen Wirecast, and start the whole thing over again. Oh, somebody says it was breaking up right from two minutes in. Okay, so, uh, you know, the bottom line, once again, is that we can do 1080p, but we can't do 1440p live. Even though I have the bandwidth, it really doesn't actually work. Uh, it's a beautiful, clear, sunny day. We got a straight line to the dish, but, like, I'm never going to be able to get 1440 to work. So I guess from now on, I just won't try, and I'll just keep it at 1080 uh, okay, everybody seems to be happy now. Let me just, I'm going to read some of your stuff. Hello from Green Bay, Wisconsin. Welcome back, my friend. I want to say I love you. Can't watch it live because it's my bedtime. Sorry about that. Lots of double talk. Chad Kosakowski. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, David won't tell you about XRP and the QFS. I'm not even sure what that is, so I guess I won't tell you about that. Quantum financial system or something? Wow, there is no stopping this information from coming out. It works well now. Okay, this is much better. I think you should not worry about the camera angles and just talk with your slides. Well, but if I could do camera angles and slides, isn't that cool too? You know, like, think about it, folks. It could be a lot more. And somebody's texting me upstairs, but I can't obviously answer texts when I'm on the phone which is kind of like what this is, is a phone call in a way. So in case you missed the first one, uh, we're going to re-upload all this, but here is the slides again where I was talking about the biggest signposts of what's going on. And again, because I was so rudely attacked, the first one would be the collapse of Netflix, crypto, and apparently imminently we're going to see 50% plus drop in housing. We're hearing that's going to happen next month. Uh, so again, if you need to sell, I would say do it now and lower the price if you haven't lowered it enough. Then we have the fuel supply of Europe again on the precipice. This is huge. This is like, you know, nail biter kind of thing for everybody. And, uh, we were talking about that last time. Then we have, of course, Elon buying, uh, Twitter and, and what appears to be a very ingenious plan to expose the amount of, uh, false traffic that was going out there. And I talked about after the 2016 election in 2017, that Twitter was just an absolute stomping ground against the cabal and they put an end to it. They change everything around and now that's all come to a head. So this suggests that there's, that there's some kind of pipeline being prepared for contentious information to come out in the hopes that the information may be less suppressed. And then of course, again, going back to the movie, we now have very much actionable information that suggests to me that within even a week or two, this could lead to indictments, arrests, and so on. Uh, there's no ambiguity here, and it's becoming very clear how this was done, why this was done, etc. Now, I have always contended, and I continue to do so, that all of this that we're seeing in the world is not an accident. It's an organized effort. It's, it's done on purpose. And it's, uh, it's done to save the planet. We're, we're actually seeing a very amazing thing going on right now. So the next one that was on my list here was, of course, this decision from the Supreme Court that was leaked in advance of it coming out. And it's very interesting because for many years, I used to be the only one or one of the only people online. Some, In many cases, I was the only person writing our articles or doing podcasts or videos online, who was aware of the degree to which wag the dog type of stuff was happening, of the degree to which a public event is actually a follow-up to something else that was considered embarrassing and that there's a need for distraction. 
This is far, far more common than we think. And again, what are they trying to do? They're trying to agitate the left. They're trying to get those people all riled up, get those people out on the streets. Honestly, if, if the people in Oklahoma want to pass a law that says they're not going to do third term, so what? Honestly, so what? Because everybody got brainwashed by something from the 1970s, which is really probably, I would say, not going to be apt to happen now. And that is the dreaded coat hanger situation. So bear in mind, folks, I was raised in a liberal state. I was raised in upstate New York. And everybody, the whole educational system is, is, is pro-abortion. It is. That's just, you're indoctrinated with that perspective when you grow up. And so, of course, in college and in high school and so on, I was told that women were taking coat hangers and injecting it into themselves and killing themselves, actually, or causing permanent harm. And I have no doubt that this really happened. However, to me, it's a responsible decision to hand it back to the states simply because some states are so radical. And it costs not that much money to take a bus ride. So, like, to think that everybody, if you don't have it in your state, that you're just simply only going to use this one option and commit suicide, I just don't think that's realistic in today's world. People are enterprising, they're resourceful, they have the internet, they can look things up, they can figure out how to do that. So it really shouldn't be a big deal. And in fact, it's to try to get people mad about Roe at this point is almost like an artifact of, an, of a forgotten age. Like, guys, there's, there's stuff that's a lot more upsetting to us right now than whether Oklahoma gets to have their own say in how they write their state law. There's stuff that's a lot more upsetting. And so we're not going to run out into the streets. Real people are not going to run out into the streets about this. In fact, most people are like, yeah, you know, it probably is a good thing for the red states to be able to calm down about this. It, a federal mandate, it's, you know, anyway. So that's a big, big topic. But you got to remember, and everybody's be, becoming clear on this, how can you kick the can around? How can you keep people distracted? Well, you can also have something like what we just saw in upstate New York. And again, incredibly, incredibly sad, but probably a lot more than just what it looks like on the surface. Then we have something that you really don't hear a whole lot about. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a very interesting thing if you're actually following what really is happening here. And this is the raid on Deutsche Bank. Now, Deutsche Bank has really been kind of like the, the center of the deep state financial system for a long time. I've heard this briefing many times. I've had insiders tell me for years and years and years, watch Deutsche Bank. Because once Deutsche Bank goes down, that means that they have not been able to stop their defeat. When that happens, it, even if nothing else is going on, if you see that happen, you know something's going on. But now this has happened in, in concert with other things going on. Plus, we have the mysterious protective fence around the Federal Reserve Building in the D.C. and New York area. I guess it's, there's, there's different ones, but... I think it's in the D.C. areas where they've got the protective fencing. But anyway, if you don't really see what's going on here, this, this might not make sense. But there's a vast... Imagine that the entire World War III was fought covertly. Imagine that the entire World War III didn't happen on the television. And you never got told what it really was until it was over. That's what I believe this is, folks. And so the infrastructure, the financial aspect of what's going on has been uh, exposed. And, and so there are arrests going on under the basis of credible warrants, and they are sealed, and then they unseal them to make the arrest, and then they seal them again. And this has been going on for years, and I'm getting a lot of good intel on this. So most of the work is already over, and there's a lot more to come, and it's coming very, very soon. So again, I really want you to look at the things that are on this list that I'm showing you, and tell me if they don't all interconnect in very, very interesting ways. And here's another one that's absolutely huge. First of all, we had Cohen, Ezra, on, uh, on a particular app that is synonymous with the original form of electronic communication. I'm being very careful. That account, I believe, is real. I've watched it for a long time, and he says a lot of really provocative stuff there. 
that has definitely caught my attention on many, many occasions. And so Ezra just recently is talking about, you know, blue beam, the idea of a hologram, the idea of eye in the sky, apparently this being a code name for something blue beam related, that there is in fact the possibility of this being used at the end. Now, I think that's what's already happening in China, honestly, because in the big city that recently has had so much trouble, you saw these pulsing blood red lights in the sky, the whole sky pulsing with blood scarlet red light. That is not natural. That does not happen. It's not atmospheric uh, sprites. It's not uh, the uh, ozone layer. It's not northern lights. Okay, it's not caused by any type of atmospheric phenomenon that would be a conventionally explained thing. This is caused by holograms. And what I'm really worried about is the possibility of something that looks like it's solid, but it's actually made out of a swarm of drones. In other words, you could have a solid object. I think they did this in one of the King Kong movies where you have a apparently like a creature, right? But then it turns out that as his arm is moving, that it's just a bunch of little drones in there and the hologram makes it look like it's his arm and if he hits the wall, the drone could shoot the wall and make it look like he did that. So you have to understand these people are really, really into the whole Wizard of Oz thing, the man behind the curtain lying to you, deceiving you, presenting something as if it was real when it really isn't, presenting something as if it was high technology when it really isn't. This is why, again, the TR-3B flying black triangle is really a hot air balloon. And the TR-4 is actually much more interesting. And again, go to thedisclosure.com if you want to actually see a picture of the TR-4 in our latest video there. So this red sky and then this, this very, very horrific situation in that city where people are literally screaming to death in their houses. Yeah, scream to death in your house because we want to save you. We're saving you <laughs> because we don't want you... <laughs> I mean, it's so ridiculous, right? Like, we want to save you. We want to make sure that you don't get sick because you might die. So let's just lock everybody in their house and they'll scream, scream, scream. We don't give a crap. We just got to... So now the official Chinese media is saying that he was too harsh on his lockdowns and that he has been removed. This is freaking gigantic. It's gigantic. Look at this list again, folks. Look at all the things that are happening right now, okay? And then that doesn't even include the overwhelming fact that people are facing up to the very, very uncomfortable realities having to do with our uh, elected officials. So look at this. This actually did happen. Tyrannical Canadian government will pay people who are too poor to continue living with dignity. Yeah, you know, we'll help you out. <laughs> We'll help you out. If you don't have enough dignity to be alive, sure, we'll just give you that euthanasia and then you'll be all good. Well, at least they're being a little more honest. You know, we got, we got to give them credit for the honesty factor here that uh, why not just actually offer it to people without deception, without subterfuge? Hey, you know, if you're too poor, you <laughs> go for it. Here, we, here you go. <laughs> it's so crazy, folks. <laughs> That guy who's being interviewed, by the way, is not in support of this, okay? He's not arguing in favor of this at all. He's very, very angry about it. So then we take a look at this, and I'm not going to read all this out loud because I really can't, but you get the point. If you take a couple seconds to take a look at my screen here, they hid it from us. They didn't want you to know about things that would help you. They didn't want you to know about antidotes and remedies. This suggests that a bunch of dorks really did want to ace a bunch of human beings and that they are doing this and that, in fact, again, we've seen that the losses are way up. And this is incredibly sad, but it is a collateral damage, unfortunately, a consequence of war, the result of there being a situation where we have more than one way in which this thing could work out. And if we hadn't have had this happen, if this hadn't have been allowed to occur, we probably would have lost the whole planet. And that's one of the key messages of Archangel Michael is the significance of having allowed this disaster to occur 
as part of a greater, obviously very, very elaborately coordinated international military campaign to awaken and quote unquote red pill the public. So this is also going on right now as if we don't already have enough to deal with, as if we don't already have enough nonsense going on in the world. Now there's this crazy heat wave going on in Texas. And again, it's, it's way too early. It's, all, it's only May. Their power grid is already strained. This is not natural. <laughs> Gotta be on the slide though, right? That's the point. That's not natural, folks. I'm, I'm sorry, it's not. And thankfully, I'm, I'm right over in the green spot just to the left of it in Colorado. It hasn't hit here yet. Uh, so I'm actually very comfortable. We're having nice warm weather. It's the first time yesterday that I went outside without a jacket on. We've had basically winter right up until now. So uh, I don't really want a big summer heat wave yet. I'd like to have some actual spring. And then we have this whole issue with like baby formula going out. And, and you know, why are they sending it to the border when they should be that, that whole thing, you know, and that's another issue that is obviously very contentious right now. And then we have this. Yeah, we'd like to make lab-produced breast milk. I think it's actually going to be very tasty. Might help, you know, produce fewer effects of climate change. <laughs> I hate this man. And I tried to give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm sorry, Bill, I'm sorry. But I had to do another impersonation because you obviously have not taken over the good in favor of the bad in your own psyche and in your own heart. All right, so anyway, uh, enough of this conspiracy stuff. Let's talk about where I think this is really going and uh, what is really going on here. So when we look at the big picture of why all of these things are happening in the world, I would encourage you to widen the aperture dramatically beyond the scope of what you thought was true and even possible. Because my line of reasoning, my work over many, many years has led me to be convinced with very, very strong certainty that we are living in a conscious universe, that we are not living in a dead Cartesian universe like the one that our scientists think of in which they pray to God on Sunday, supposedly, and then debunk God's existence during the weekdays. <laughs> there was an unholy alliance between church and state where the church said, let us handle God and you handle, you handle science. And we're going to keep the two separate, which means that science tells you God doesn't exist. Science tells you that you don't have a soul or that if, you know, that once, once you die, your consciousness is the result of electrical activity in your brain, and once that brain no longer functions, you cease to exist. Well, the new science that I've been spending the last 25 years going public about teaches us that the universe is actually made of consciousness. The intrinsic consciousness that you are using right now as you watch this video and as you hear me speak and as the sound vibrations are moving the speaker in your computer equipment, which is causing the air in the room to vibrate, is causing the sound of my voice to hit your eardrums, vibrate the pinna, go into the cochlea, and send electrical stimulus to your ear that leads to you perceiving this as a sound. And then because other parts of your brain are working, you understand that those sounds make speech, and you're able to interpret and understand what I'm saying. This is obviously a very complex biochemical mechanism and at the same time, we now have evidence that the body is not needed for consciousness. And I got this all the way back in college with studies that I learned in various psychology classes I was taking about people who had no brain tissue because they had something called water on the brain or hydroencephaly. The entirety of their brain is compressed down to the size of a slice of bologna that lines the interior of the skull all the way around. Just like a SCOBY, like if you're growing kombucha culture or something. They have this little bitty thin, thin eighth of an inch thick brain tissue around the inside of their skull and everything else is water. And yet this guy had a 127 IQ and graduated from Cambridge University with a degree in mathematics. 
Where was his brain? It was almost entirely gone, and yet he was still able to function. They've also done this with salamanders, where they've burned almost their entire brains out. They've vivisected them. It's very disgusting. But while they're alive, they destroy their entire brain. And with almost every single part of the brain destroyed, the salamander can still remember how to get through a maze. It's a hideous experiment, and I would never do this, but it's been done. But when we go deeper than this, we start to find out that the universe is made of photons, and photons are curiously geometric. Einstein's model of electromagnetic energy being the underpinning of the universe is fundamentally saying that light is the underpinning of the universe because if E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, all that Einstein stuff really goes around light. And his idea of trying to build the universe from electromagnetic energy was an attempt to adhere to the traditional religious sophism of in the beginning there was light. Well, it's true. The universe is made of photons, and the photons are produced by consciousness. So you can create photons with your consciousness. And when you read the Law of One, which again is this spiritual authority source that I've been using in, as a cornerstone of my work since 1996, again going back 26 years, the Law of One makes it very clear that we are in a holographic reality and that it's made by consciousness. And they presented many scientific concepts that were very ahead of their time. This was 1981, and it was done by a group of three people using intuitive protocols. They used their own psychic abilities to bring in these words, and the words were very profound. And so I've lived in this alternative modality of existence that the Law of One provided me with Ever since I discovered it in January of 1995, I believe, or 96, no, it was 96, definitely 96. So January 96 is when I first found this. And I want to say what an impact the Law of One had on my life. I mean, I've had synchronicity my whole life uh, where I look at the clock and I see 444, 333, 1111, 1010 all these different types of number patterns. And if you're not really hip to what's going on here, this may not make any sense to you, but when you begin a path of conscious seeking, when you begin a path of spiritually looking for answers, synchronicity is the most common way that God, if you will use that term for a minute, will begin speaking to you. And it's not that difficult to see. You're going to start having very strange things happening. You're going to be thinking about something really profound. You haven't looked at the clock in a really long time. You go, hey, what time is it? And then you look at the clock and it's 11.11 or it's 3.33. Wow. This started happening to me back when I was still in high school and having a very, very difficult life and hopeless and, and sad and just dealing with all the bullying and all the teenage angst that happens to so many people as they're growing up. It was a very interesting thing to encounter this greater spiritual reality in the Law of One, which answered so many questions I'd had throughout my life and explained by 96 why for the last four years I kept constantly seeing these repeating numbers on clocks everywhere. I mean, it was just getting to be crazy. So this is not something that happens to everybody, but it's a very common way in which, again, the universe will teach you that it is a conscious hologram. Now, one of the things that the Law of One has taught us that has created no, no lack of uh, incredible anger and madness and fear and pain, I was just seeing it again with Mike's video, the one I put up on uh, the eon of brightness there. Uh, you know, take those words, put them in the opposite direction. You know, you know what I'm doing. Anyway, uh, yeah, like, wow. Some of the comments on my latest video on Mike's thing uh, are incredibly aggressive and incredibly nasty. And it kind of made me wonder, like, did Jesus say anything other than what's in the Bible? Did Jesus ever speak more than the words that are attributed to him in the Bible? Well, obviously, yes, right? Obviously, yes. There's a lot more that would have actually been said. There was a lot more going on than we think. And the law of one 
just blows the lid off of the whole thing by saying, wait a minute, everybody. Jesus is not just some spiritual figure who came to earth in order to be loved by people. Jesus was actually a very interesting and special thing where the mind of our galaxy embodied into human form. And that's not common. That doesn't usually happen, apparently. So the name in the Law of One that they use for the galaxy is Logos. And in Greek, that also means word. So Logos, word, these terms are all interchangeable. And this, this raises some interesting ideas. Uh, Jesus says in the book of John, the book of John, it wasn't by Jesus, but the book of John at the beginning says, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So in the beginning there was the Logos, and the Logos was God, and the Logos was with God. That's how you could actually read that in the original Aramaic and Greek. In the beginning there was the Logos, and the Logos was God. So that's God the Father, and the Logos was with God. That's God the Son. So God the Son, in the Law of One terms, is literally the mind of our galaxy, which is the Logos. It is the cosmic creator that designed these 22 archetypes, a pattern of soul evolution, a blueprint, if you will, that we're all apparently supposed to be following here. So it's very interesting to see how all this happens because the Logos had to do this through a very specific process. Uh, oops, i got to go back to the... So, Jesus didn't just have it guaranteed when he showed up as a human being that his mission would work. This is important. This is one of the things the Law of One tells us. That Jesus actually had to fulfill a contract with God the Father through his own free will. And it was through his own diligent spiritual work, through the purification of his personality that he thus was able to embody the Logos, okay? What they're saying is that Jesus achieved something, going back to the slide, called personality transparency. And so by doing this in law of one terms, when Jesus achieved personality transparency, that means he became the Logos. So here is a passage. This is passage 74-11. Uh, where they're talking about personality transparency. So what you're going to see here, just, just so that you're not running into this, because sometimes I go too fast, and I, I apologize if I do. Uh, somebody said he saw Bigfoot in Salford. It made a sound that I would not want to hear twice in my life. Uh, did the Logos walk in at the baptism of Jesus? Yes, yes, you got it. That was uh, Mist Fay, Feminist Soul Wisdom. I think I got that. Or Famous Soul Wisdom. <laughs> I'm sorry if I blew your name. I really am. I truly am sorry about that. But uh, anyway, uh, personality transparency is where you do the work to clear yourself, essentially, like they said, for your personality to merge with the Logos so that it's transparent, meaning that who you were before you became the Logos isn't really there anymore. Isn't that interesting? So this involves the, the discipline of the personality. In order to get your personality to become transparent, you must first discipline the personality. This is critical, the personality discipline. So then they're going to tell you that there's three main things. So it, again, if you want to become more like Jesus, if that's something that appeals to you, and I know it does to me, I think a lot of us want to be more spiritual, and that appears to be the whole point of all the things that are happening in the world right now. How does the law of one, which again is a Christian source, they, they profess the divinity of Christ. There's no question about this whatsoever. It's all over the place. So all these people who are so upset saying, oh my God, law of one, law of one. Look, they are very happy about Christianity. And what they did is to come in and give us some updates that we really, really needed to help understand what's going on. So how would you reach, according to Law of One, how would you reach the personality transparency that somebody like Jesus got? Well, they say there's three parts to it. Are you ready for this? The first part is 
to know yourself. And let's just stop there because it's a three-part formula and you can already, I've already shown you all three parts, but again, know yourself. Now, what does this really mean? Well, this is one of the reasons why they, they advocate meditation so much is that knowing yourself is about really taking the time to understand who you are and how you got to be the way you are. And so there's a lot of stuff in the Law of One about the importance of reflecting on your past. And they say there's only two things that can exponentially increase your spiritual growth. Reflect upon your past for how it informs the present. And then seek the love in this moment. Each additional seeking of love in the moment exponentially increases the power you have in the present. Each additional memory from your past that you remember exponentially increases your personal power. The appropriate law of one way to view trauma as it's happening in your life now is to analogize it with all other traumas that feel the same. If you had someone else in the past hurt you in the same way that you're being hurt now, are you going to behave the same way or are you going to do something different? And this is a question that we all need to ask ourselves. Do we decide to be abused? Are we willing to accept tyranny? If you found yourself in the horrific situation like Johnny Depp was having, both of them were having, can you get out of that situation? And I would hope the answer is yes, but this is what's happening on a global level. Whether you have personal experience with psychopaths, narcissists, dysfunctional relationships or not, at this point it doesn't even seem to matter because now the real point is we're all in this together. We're going through a very, very nasty breakup with a partner who wants to kill themselves rather than let go of control. And this, again, is one of the things I studied academically in college. It has absolutely nothing to do with my own recent divorce. We were harmonious. That was fine. It's not like Johnny Depp at all. Please don't make those analogies if anybody did. All I'm saying is there are a lot of people out there suffering in the world, and although my divorce was harmonious, what's happening in the world right now is a very non-harmonious divorce, a very violent a very chaotic, a very nasty fight to the death, take all your money, leave you for dead type of situation. That's what we're looking at. It's terrifying. But again, this is intended to knock you out of your comfort zone. So knowing yourself is knowing your experience. Having the mastery of your past experiences so that when a new situation comes up, well, this feels familiar to me. So if you've been through abusive relationships, if you've had people abusing you, if you've been treated unfairly, if you've been treated unkindly, if you've had a lot of uh, bad things happen to you, now you understand what these people are. You understand what you're seeing in the world. You understand they will never tell you the truth. And they will never be nice to you. You cannot comply your way out of tyranny. You can't. The more that you give them what they want, the more they will ask for and this is what I studied in college. This is the psychodynamics of this type of personality. They actually have physiological damage in their brain. There's seven different areas of the brain required to process empathy, and these people don't have them. And it's a very sad thing when you see examples of it in intimate relationships, and it's even more outrageous when you see what appears to be an organized global structure created by people with this exact disability where not only do they not like other people, but they want to see them eliminated. And that is the highest goal that this type of altered psyche can have. They really do want to knife you in the back, leave you for dead. That's their highest aspiration. Life didn't work out for them. They don't like being alive. They don't like other people. They're pissed off about everything. And so they want to punish life. They want to punish life forms. And the more innocent and, and uh, defenseless that life form is, then the more they're going to enjoy the sadism. It's very important that all of us understand that these people are real, that they're serious, they're dead serious about what they want to do. They're running with the ball and they're being stopped. And again, all of this is part of a consciousness hologram. So knowing yourself in the threefold discipline of personality we're discussing would also involve knowing where you are right now and understanding that the most brutal deviants are now apparently the ones that have created this structure and they're being opposed. 
So the second part is, first part is know yourself. The second part is accept yourself. And this, again, is incredibly important. Self-acceptance, as I've always said, is the bullseye. You can get really, really locked up in very elaborate esoteric metaphysics. You can get all tied up in, in this set of data, and we have a quote about this coming up in a minute. And you can get very confused. You can get very confused by all the information. And I see many, many people here being information junkies and, and being mad at me if I'm not giving you the, the kind of presentation that you think you want to have. I'm asking you to get real with yourself. I'm asking you to dig deep inside and ask yourself, is this thing that we're seeing in the world really safe and positive or is it evil and negative? What do you really believe? Do you really believe this is the end of the world? Do you really believe we're all going to die? Do you really believe that there's no hope, that nukes are going to go off, that the economy is going to collapse, that all these terrible things are happening and are going to happen? I don't. I genuinely don't. And it's because I have unconventional sources of information that are giving me very interesting insights into what's going on. So know yourself and then accept yourself. Self-acceptance is so difficult. It seems like it would be easy, but it really isn't. We are always prone to want to take the negative opinions of others as sacrosanct and, and to denigrate ourselves. If others are denigrating us, it takes a, a lot of discipline to accept yourself regardless of what others think. In other words, self-acceptance is not conditional upon getting other people to like you first. It's just the opposite. You have to create a loving space in your own life for that loving space to be filled by others. And that's what I've been working on myself. So going back to the slide again, uh, becoming the creator is the third step. And this is something that people have a real hard time with. Okay, this is not like traditional... Uh, religion at all become the creator Ugh. well yeah what does jesus say in john 14 12 you want to go look that up for a minute if you're angry about this jesus said as i do these things meaning the jesus miracles so shall ye do these things and greater things for i go unto my father mother god because the original word in aramaic means father mother it's not just father it's non-gendered before I go into my Father God, you will do greater things than me, says Jesus. You will do greater things than me. That doesn't even seem possible, does it? It's like, wow, how could that even be possible? But yet, that's what we're dealing with. So when you get to this stage of self-acceptance and becoming the creator, you achieve this thing called personality transparency. So they say... The third step is that step which, when accomplished, renders one the most humble servant of all, transparent in personality, and completely able to know and accept other selves. So this is very interesting because what we're seeing here, again, is this concept of personality transparency, which applies directly to Jesus. And Jesus, again, in the Law of One, several places, they say he became the Logos. That's what personality transparency is. Ultimately, in Law of One terms, all of us are here to reunify with cosmic consciousness, to go back to our oneness in the cosmos. So let's have a little more of this. In relation to the pursuit of the magical working, and when they say magical, they do not mean black magic. They say Christians can do magic as well. Magical work to them means that you're in an altered state of consciousness and that is required for you to have access to the creator. You, you must get into an altered state of consciousness to be able to start getting all the cool things happening that the universe really wants you to have. That the reason why we're here, the reason why this gets exciting is when you start awakening and you figure out the whole thing's a hologram and you have synchronicity and you have telekinesis, and you're no longer worried about whether you're going to make it. Because if your physical body dies, that's just a meat computer and it drops down and it rots away. And the essence of consciousness that you are exists forever. And nothing can happen. Uh, somebody said, what happened to the lighting? I don't know. You know, you guys always get upset about all kinds of weird stuff. So please just don't haze. Okay. In relation to the pursuit of the magical working, the continuing discipline of the personality involves the adept in knowing itself, 
accepting itself and thus clearing the path toward the great indigo gateway to the Creator. To become the Creator is to become all that there is. There is then no personality in the sense with which the adept had when it began its learn teaching. Isn't that interesting? People get so sassy, they get so argumentative, they're so like wound up and screwed up and dysfunctional, right? And, and, and you don't have that personality anymore. You don't have the anxiety. You don't have the anger. You don't have the jealousy. You don't have the combativeness. When somebody online is, is lighting me up with fire and saying, fuck, all this kind of stuff, like whatever, okay? That's not an enlightened person. That's not an adept. That's not a person who's figured out what you're here for. That's a person who is throwing attacks and will now reincarnate and experience this later on. Jesus' big secret was reincarnation. He told it to uh, one of the 12 apostles, Peter, who then told it to St. Clement of Alexandria. St. Clement of Alexandria told it to Origen and Origen's work De Principius or The Principles is one of the foundational underlying theological documents that is the underpinning of modern Christianity from Origen. Origen got it from St. Clement. St. Clement got it from Peter the Apostle. Jesus' big secret teachings, reincarnation. The Romans didn't like that because it, it violated the airtight concept of a father, mother, and Holy Spirit where like there's no other, or father, son, and Holy Spirit. The, the mother isn't even really acknowledged, right? Holy Spirit is inferred to be feminine. Two out of the three are masculine, father and son. Well, that's not really the way this works. People interpreting the words of Jesus is different than Jesus speaking. And Jesus might have had a lot more to say because he is, in fact, the embodiment of the galaxy. You could ultimately, possibly, achieve some degree of personality transparency yourself. However, the likelihood of any of us getting full transparency is very, very minimal. This is a very special thing that happened with Jesus, but it represents, if you will, a goal that we would all have to strive for, something that we would like to see. So then as you look at this, uh, this you don't have a personality anymore. Uh, by knowing yourself and accepting yourself, they talk about this a lot in the Law of One. You start to understand, yeah, okay, I figured it out. I figured it out. This is all consciousness. It's all mind. And I made this. I am that mind. I made this. I made the universe. What do I want myself to know? If there are parts of me that are sad, if there are parts of me that are suffering, if there are parts of me that are in pain, can I reach out to those parts? Can I make those parts of me feel happier? Can I make myself feel safer? Can I go out there and educate myself? Can I teach myself that this isn't as bad as I think? Because you see, you're no longer looking at everybody else as different. You're looking at everybody else as the same as you are, but they just haven't woken up enough. They haven't woken up enough to see what's really going on, to understand what the universe is really about. The apparent happening is disassociation, whether the truth is service to self and thus true disassociation from other selves, or service to others and thus true association with the heart of all other selves and disassociation only from the illusory husks which prevent the adept from correctly perceiving the self and other self as one. Hmm. Now, this, this statement about disassociation was in response to a question that the source was asked. So uh, the, the idea being that when you become an adept, you become disassociated. Now, let's just start, let's break this all down. So first of all, this context was that they were talking about how you become an adept, how you become an enlightened being, Okay. And again, know yourself, accept yourself, and become the creator. Sounds easy enough, but become the creator, they, they talk about that too. They literally want you, they advise you to gaze into the mirror and see the face of the creator. But then they also encourage you to gaze in everyone else's face and see the image of the creator and to gaze at all the nature around you and see the face of the creator. 
So this concept of disassociation, as you move in the path of adepthood, disassociation means that you're separating yourself. You are not associating. You are disassociated. You're separating yourself from what's out there. You're, you're disassociated. And so that's how this all works. The disassociation means that as you want to become an adept, you have to isolate yourself more and more. And all of us have been disassociated by the lockdowns. Therefore, all of us are being invited on the path of the adept. The lockdowns had the very, very interesting aspect of bringing in an adepthood type of lifestyle to many people who probably up until then were very social, largely outgoing, always getting in the car, always driving around, having friends, going out to eat, going out to drink, having lots of entertainment, going to movie theaters. And then all of a sudden you just got to stay home. And now it's like, whoa, if my house isn't that good, there's nowhere else to go. So all of a sudden people want to buy a bigger house. Well, that whole thing is falling apart. And so this is... Uh, this concept of disassociation then goes into the second line here, which starts to sound a little freaking bizarre. It's a little bit bizarre that we're, you're only disassociating if you're on the positive path, because we don't care about the negative path, because on the negative path, they, they make it very clear, yeah, you're disassociated from all others. You're just this a-hole who thinks that your, F, that your stuff doesn't stink, and that... Uh, you know, a service to self person is, is going to be very manipulative, very dominant, very controlling. They will lie constantly and they will basically have this goal to try to torment you, to sarcastically laugh at your misfortune. They're bullies. They like causing harm. They like causing pain. They want you to suffer. They don't want you to feel good about yourself. They don't want you to be happy. They don't want you to like your life. They want you to be afraid. They want you to have constant anxiety. And... If they can, they will set you up, they will abuse and manipulate your loving, compassionate nature, and they'll weaponize that against you, knife you in the back, and leave you for dead, stealing all of your money and everything else they can get their hands on. That's reality. There's people like that, and that's their main motive. They want to beat someone up every day. I've had bosses like this. I've had exes like this. It's horrible if you get stuck with somebody like this. And now we're dealing with it on a global level. It's very sad, but it's also very revealing in terms of what this really means. So why in the world would the law of one call other people illusory husks? Well, the idea is, and let me again show you that in case you're just forgetting, disassociation only if you're on the positive path from the illusory husks, which prevent the atom from correctly perceiving self and other self as one. What does this mean? This means that you're not going to really be helping people on the highest level by interacting with them one-on-one -on -one in person. As you get into this path of adepthood, other people who are not yet on that path, they're going to want to rob you. They're going to want to lie to you. They're going to want to hurt you. They're going to want to bully you because if you happen to have the disfortune of a psychopath, they don't like you. They're going to pretend that they do. And that's what we're seeing in the world right now. They don't like you. They keep lying to you. They keep telling you, oh, don't worry about it. We're doing something for your higher good. We're trying to do the right thing. No, they're not. And you know that. And so that's where the gaslighting aspect comes in. The deliberate lying and, and creation of a vastly false reality for the purpose of manipulating you into believing something that is not true. It's just like Scooby-Doo. And if it wasn't for you meddling kids, and off comes the mask, right? That's what it always turns out to be. It wasn't really a monster, was it? It wasn't really something evil. And why did they show us Scooby-Doo for year after year after year after year in Saturday morning cartoons? Where every single episode, what happens at the end? It's some doofus with a mask on who got busted because of you meddling kids. Why did they do this so much? Because that's what the whole thing is, folks. It's a big setup. They don't have the power they want you to think they have. They don't have the armies they want you to think they have. They don't have the money they want you to think they have. And they certainly don't have the support. And that's one of the things that's coming out with this whole Twitter situation. So we're not really in our bodies. And you can connect with people's oneness on a deeper level. And if you try to deal with people face-to-face, -face, you may not be getting the greatest benefit of the meditation 
on the oneness of all there is. This disassociation from the miasma, which means actually it's like a, a cloud of horrible smelling, like poop really is what that word means. This disassociation from the miasma of illusion and misrepresentation of each and every distortion is a quite necessary portion of the adept's path. It may be seen by others to be unfortunate. Hmm, that's weird. This is a very strange thing, and what is it really saying? Well, let's, let's think about this in, in the most scientific way that we can, okay? The, the basic idea here, and yes, this is a dimmer shot, so you're going to be sad because it's not as bright, I am sorry. I got stuff on my guitar. Come on, I lit it up for you. You see this light down here? Cut me a break, folks. Some of the some of the scenes are a little. Lynn Winters sent me uh, eleven eleven, just dropping a love bomb and wondering concern for you, David. One love. Well, it's interesting. She said she's concerned about me because this is going back to the slide again. It may be seen by others to be unfortunate. And again, the previous sentence they said that you start to see others in their physical human body form as illusory husks. In other words, it's very, very rare that other people are going to really activate their own adepthood and be able to meet you on the level as a fellow adept. It would be great if that would happen. I'd love to have a non-narcissistic monastery where we could really train people properly and get you get your you know Christ abilities activated and powered up, and maybe in the future we will. But you have to have rules. That's why there is a... Uh, a code of honor and a code of, of conduct in how these types of organizations run. And nowadays, the only thing that they're going to say, oh my God, you have a cult, you have a cult. That's why I've never done it, folks. That's why after all these years, you've never had a meditation group. You've never had a channeling group. You've never had a people come together and get to David. I mean, once in a while, I do it at a conference, but even those are, are you know, few and far between. And the one I just did, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to show up in person because of the threats that we have. So, again, this disassociation from the miasma of illusion and the misrepresentation of each and every distortion is quite necessary, and it may be seen by others to be unfortunate. I'm going to get a little bit more into this in just a second, but the point is that they're again saying that as you go into the adept path, you become very lonely. And you need to be away from other people as you're developing this adepthood. There is, this is why solo meditation is the fastest way to get to where you want. And again, here I am up in the mountains all by myself. And I've been here this way since last September completely alone. Uh, no interactions, no other humans around. I mean, I do occasionally go to the grocery store and some things like this or fill up some water. But I mean... I'm basically completely alone. I've been that way since late September when I started to do the disclosure. It's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult. Uh, and at the same time, I was very aware that I absolutely needed this path for my own process. So again, as it says right in the slide here, it may be seen by others to be unfortunate. What am I trying to say here in this kind of weird, semi-awkward way, I've been saying, look, I needed this time off, and it may seem unfortunate to you that David isn't always there like a reliable clock week after week giving you amazing stuff to think about. And I'm sorry that I haven't been always there, but frankly, some very, very interesting stuff has been happening to me. I am experiencing telekinesis. I know that for a lot of people, they may find that impossible to believe. They may think it's hubris or hyperbolic that I'm saying this. It is not. I assure you, it is real. It is happening. And I think the most surprising thing for me is that if a voice is talking to you in your mind and moves something in front of you at the same time to prove that it's being, that it is what it is, that's actually scary as hell. Okay, so the telekinesis stuff that's happening to me I didn't think that I would have a problem with it. I didn't think that I would dislike telekinesis. In fact, one of the instances of telekinesis made me cry extensively. I just cried my head off. So, uh, and I haven't even gotten to the main topic and we're running out of time here. So 
Uh, we are going to talk about the solar activity some, but I think I'm, I'm going to have to do another show more of that. Because this is becoming a, a nice philosophical show, and that's okay. I, I really only wanted this to be two hours, so maybe we'll change the title and do the sunspot cycle thing a little bit later. Okay, so uh, I'm going to share with you a little bit more now about becoming the adept and how this all works out. It says each entity is the creator. The entity, as it becomes more and more conscious of itself, gradually comes to a turning point. And this is very significant in everyone's life. At that turning point, you decide whether you're going to be seeking to be evil or good, which is service to self being the evil one or service to others being the good one. The seeker becomes the adept when it has balanced with minimal adequacy the energy centers of red, orange, yellow, and blue with the addition of the green for the positive, must thus moving into indigo work. So this looks pretty weird and has a lot of elements to it. So what's going on here? What it's saying is that the, the chakras are these energy centers that the Hindus referred to. The Bible refers to them by the seven number being repeated in the book of Revelations many times. The Edgar Cayce readings, which again, deeply professed a love of Christ and profess the divinity of Christ. The Edgar Cayce reading said that, that the chakras are primarily represented in the Bible by the book of Revelation, the seven lampstands, all these different things representing the seven chakras. And also, as Joseph Campbell discussed in The Hero with a Thousand Faces, when we look at the uh, texts that we get from other religions, we see similar types of things. So, so this concept of the chakras appears in Hinduism in the Mahabharata as the division point of the three and a half, where you're halfway to seven. And that again represents what the law of one here calls the turning point, where uh, the turning point is where you decide either to seek service to others or service to self. So in the Mahabharata, he's at the three and a half point and he's deciding whether to align with the armies of the south, which represents the lower chakras, or the armies of the north, which represents the human spiritual impulse and the higher chakras. So a seeker is what you are when you're interested enough to watch a video like this. So I would imagine everybody watching this video is a seeker. But then to become an adept, you have to balance these energy centers. And that's a long subject, something I'm going to get a lot more into in my next course, Ascension philosophy, which I'm getting ready to start pretty soon. Uh, and I do need to do something that earns money this year. I can't just go moneyless. So please, if you can, go to thedisclosure.com. And I'm going to be releasing Michael Prophecies pretty soon as a standalone product. And I'm also very soon going to be doing a full six-week course again called Ascension Philosophy. This type of content that I'm doing right now, you're going to get way more of it. It's not really going to be political. It's, it's going to be primarily philosophical because I can tell you what's going on, but then the question is, what do you do about it? And where does it take you as a soul? The adept begins then to do less of the preliminary or outer work. This is once you've balanced your chakras, which is really about, again, self-acceptance. Know yourself, accept yourself. And then, instead of doing less of the outer work, which is function, you begin to do more of the inner work, which has to do with being. And so this is literally what I was essentially forced into doing by my higher self, by Archangel Michael. Earlier this year, I had a time loop happen again. It was after I put the Michael prophecies together and sent it off to the Alliance. This book is very, very high octane, folks. And I wanted the good guys to have this intelligence before I made it available to everyone, which means bad guys could also start attacking the book, attacking me. I'm really not that excited in some level about Michael Prophecies coming out because one of the things that I expect will happen is people being mean to me more than they have been. You know, they're, they're not going to like this. They're going to be angry. They're going to be judgmental. And, and that part is going to happen. So we're just going to take it one step at a time, just like we do with everything. So as a result of being up here in the mountains and being alone all the time, I am doing a lot more of this inner work that has to do with being. And as it's going to say here in a minute, true freedom is seen by those not free as being negative or evil. 
So I'm sorry if, if it upsets you that I'm not always out there publicly, but I've needed to do this. As the adept becomes a more and more consciously crystallized entity, it gradually manifests more and more of that which it always has been since before time, that is, the one infinite creator. Now, as far as evil adepts are concerned, the service to self adept satisfies itself with the shadows, and grasping the light of day, he or she will toss back the head in grim laughter and prefer the darkness. So again, in that previous quote, they said that the, the negative adept, the evil adept, will try to activate intelligent infinity or the pineal gland without the green ray, without the heart. They don't like people. They don't want to be nice. They don't want to be loving. And they frankly don't care. <laughs> so if you end up in a situation uh, like what I was describing earlier, where your mind is filled to the bursting with the most abstruse and unmanageable of ideas, that's where we are right now. Where we are right now is a terrifying situation in which your mind is trying to process this massive amount of information. There's all these different things going on. They're really scary. They affect you cognitively and they affect you emotionally because it also causes a very real sense of panic, if you will. So uh, the conscious mind of the adept may be full to bursting of the most abstruse and unmanageable ideas so that further ideation towards the creator becomes impossible and work in blue ray or indigo is blocked through overactivation. Now, I actually believe that many, many of the people in this audience have overactivation. Because just take a look at this again. What does it say here? Uh, the conscious mind may have the most abstruse, unmanageable ideas. You can't really ideate and become more of an adept and because you're, you're overactivated. So what do they say to do about this? They say it is then that the adept would call upon the new mind, untouched and virgin, and dwell within the archetype of the new and unblemished mind without bias, without polarity, full of the magic of the Logos. So this is what I'm actually doing. If you haven't already figured it out by that quote, I am calling upon the new mind. I am asking you to think differently. I am asking you to look at what's happening in the world right now as a brief blip in your multidimensional evolution, which will go on for millions and millions of years. This time that you're living in right now is the time that you're going to have the old man stories. When I was your age, I remember how they had COVID-19. And during those years, they lied to us. The government was full of people who wouldn't tell the truth. And they made up all kinds of stories. And I was there. In the beginning, I was right there. You're going to have old man stories, and they're going to be awesome. Because it's going to change so fast from here. That's the thing, folks. There's suppressed technology. There's really, really cool stuff that we're going to get to have. And it will become obvious pretty soon that this really is tantamount to a dimensional shift. We are not living in the reality that we think. This is something very, very different that's going on. There's extraterrestrials here. They've crash landed. We got their technology and they set the whole thing up, not for the earth to be destroyed, but for the earth to be saved. I'm now very convinced that the big secret truth that underlies all the stuff I've been telling you all these years is that we are, in fact, not going to die in the solar flash or a tsunami or a pole shift. And that excites me greatly because I believed it for so long that the only way to get rid of this entrenched evil on a particular third dimensional world is to basically flush the toilet, start over, have the planet be wiped out, and those who learned what they were supposed to learn are rescued by benevolent ETs. This has happened on Earth before, apparently many times, including the uh, Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh, which becomes Noah's Ark story in the Bible. According to Zechariah Sitchin, it's a derivative of the original Gilgamesh story. There was a flood. There was a catastrophe on Earth. When we get all the disclosure about Atlantis, we're going to be freaking amazed by all the stuff that's hidden under the ice down there. They've been studying since the 1950s. A mothership that's a mile long that you can sing to it and it changes shape. 
the, the structure of the object changes shape and it heals itself as the ice melts. So as the ice melts into water and there's a cracked part of the ship, the hull just knits itself right back together. It's very, very fascinating. There's so much that we're going to learn. There's so much technology that's been given to us. It's as if the ultimate Santa Claus bounty, where he just said, frick it, I'm just going to empty the whole sleigh into your living room. I don't care about any of the other kids. I'm just going to do the whole frickin' big old Santa bag right in your living room. There is nothing that you can buy that's as cool as the stuff that we're going to get. I don't care if you're a billionaire. I don't care if you're Elon Musk and you're worth $148 billion or whatever his notional value is. He doesn't have this stuff. He can't buy this stuff. He doesn't have enough money to get this stuff. The stuff that we're going to get is stuff that nobody can buy, that nobody has access to. And once we have it, our world transforms in such a profound way that why are you so worried about the final exam? Why are you so worried about the next few weeks? I don't have any doubt in my mind that these people are going to be arrested. They are incapable of defending themselves to any substantial way that will turn this thing around. They can think that they are. They, they're trying everything they know, and it is not working. And it's going to continue to not work. And with the criteria I said earlier, including the movie about horses, something big is coming, folks, and I expect that it's coming very soon. Everything is paved. The DS is freaking out like I've never seen. And again, the best way to handle this right now is to call upon the virgin mind. Don't get all stuck in the minutia. Get away from it. Get away from the reading. Get away from the podcasts. Get away from the videos. Get away from your computer. Go outside. See the sun. Breathe the air. Talk to the animals. And do something besides freak out. Okay, because this is not a bad thing. It's a very, very artistically structured global initiation, a joint activity between humans and benevolent human ETs to bring us to this moment of cosmic awakening. So we're calling upon that new mind. And then when they're talking about this magical work, I want to make it clear that Christians can do this too. So they say, what is the difference between prayers and churches? and the work that you're describing of the adept. And they say there is no difference. If those in your churches were adepts, in other words, if they are consciously full of will, of seeking, and of conscious knowledge of the calling, there would be no difference. Now this again, every, every law of one passage always seems to require interpretation. That's just the way it goes. What is the calling? The calling is this concept that we are in trouble and that we need help and we're praying for help. And the law of one says that there is a whole genre of beings in the universe that are much closer to the creator, which we could think of as seraphim, cherubim, or archangels. And these beings are very, very intimately involved in our lives. And the way you're going to start to see this is with clock synchronicity and things like this. And then as you become more of an adept, the telekinesis starts to happen. And they've even given it a new word. They call it uh, new words, new term. They call it executive function. And apparently everyone who is ascending is having this double being forming. And what does this mean? This means that you're going to have a ghost that is you. It's yourself in the fourth density. So... Something is coming our way. Something is going to happen that activates us, this other part of ourselves, where we can now flip over into that part of ourselves. So if you think about great master yogis, they have bilocation. This is one of the things you hear about. Here's the guy, and he's sitting in his chair, and he's meditating. And then at the same time, he shows up in a village hundreds of miles away, and there he is talking to people and laughing and doing his thing. That's by location. That is caused because you have two beings. You have your physical body and you have an energy being that looks the same but is activating as we move through this process. Now that I've really been studying this, it does still appear that at some point we will get rid of our third dimensional body, but it's because the fourth dimensional body that you bilocate into has become so full and so well formed that you don't need the 3D body. You could create one if you want, but you don't need one. And so 
that process begins with your fourth dimensional ghost wanting to get your attention. It is you. It would look like you if you could see it. You won't see it. It's going to be invisible. And your ghost is going to try to get your attention by things like clock synchronicities, by things like the right people calling you at the right time, you just so happen to bump into somebody, all of these types of paranormal events. And then as it goes on, it will also turn into telekinesis. And that's what started to happen to me, which, as it turns out, is scary as hell. I, I, I don't like telekinesis, as it turns out. I thought I would. I really thought I wanted it. And then when I got it, it's like, whoa, this is just really crazy. Because even with all of the things that happened to me, when objects start moving and it's clearly something that is not caused by you, you have no defenses left as a human being. You are done. You cannot ignore that that damn thing moved. You can't go back to the way you were. You cannot go back. You can't. That's, that's what I've concluded. So again, because people who, who identify as Christian, they get so riled up, they don't think God exists outside the Bible. But I ask you this question, did Jesus say things that are not written down in the Bible? Of course he did. Is there a living consciousness where the Logos, the gal gal galaxy, speaks to you the way it did to Jesus? Yes. Yes. The Catholics and, and all of that Roman oppression tried to deny you the kingdom of heaven within. They tried to deny you John 14, 12, where he says, As I do these things, which includes prophetic dreams and visions, so shall you do them. That's right out of Jesus' own mouth, and it made it into the Bible, all right? So Christians can be adepts, but again, looking at the quote here, the key is being filled with willpower, seeking the light, using the powers of your concentration, and knowing that there is a calling. And calling, again, means that there are beings out there, multidimensional beings, who can help us but the really sad part is that they can't do it unless they're invited. The more people actually do pray, the more these beings actually can do. And there's no other way around it for them. They have to have us praying or meditating and, and calling out to them in order to take action. So the more of us do the calling, the more action will result. So uh, the efficacy of the calling is a function of the magical qualities of those who call. And again, Christians can be magical, as they're saying. And what does magical mean? The desire to seek the altered, altered state of consciousness desired. So that's a magical quality. Now, does that mean the use of chemicals? No, no, chemicals are not required. In fact, all of the Archangel Michael stuff that has been done that is now so fascinating in terms of its time looping into the present was done when I'd been sober for three and a half years, no drugs, no alcohol, no caffeine, no anything. That, that, that cleanse that I had, it, it, I was also doing a vegan diet. I mean, the whole thing, I was living a very, very austere and pure lifestyle, completely chemical free, but I did very much seek an altered state of consciousness. And this gets into the deep meditation where you can then hear the voice of the Creator if you're doing it properly. Most people think when they're meditating, oh, well, I don't want to have any thoughts at all. I don't want to have any thoughts at all. That's not true. You want to have thoughts, but you want to respect that the thoughts that come into your mind when you've cleared your mind are the thoughts of the Creator. Isn't that interesting? The thoughts of the Creator. When you get clear, you start to have some personality transparency, your mind becomes God. Your mind becomes the creator and the things that are in your mind is the creator's mind. This is personality transparency. It's happening in here. It's happening in here. This is what you want. You want your mind to merge with the Creator. You want personality transparency, which means your jealousy, your arrogance, your foolishness, your suspicion, your anger, your sadness, all that stuff goes away. You don't... 
catalyst repeats until it is no longer useful, right? Useful means it upsets you. And catalyst is an experience that causes you to be upset. So the law of one teaches us that the universe, or in this case, life on earth, will continue upsetting us until we learn what we need to learn. And we're at a cosmic tipping point on earth where we have learned what we need to learn. And therefore, it's all going in very interesting directions. And I did still want to talk about solar cycles, but I probably am going to have to make another show. This will be the introduction to the solar cycle show because this is all very important preliminary discussion. And I really honestly did not want to go beyond two hours today. Give you guys a break. The penetration of the veil may be seen to begin to have its roots in the gestation of green ray activity, that all compassionate love that demands no return. Now, why are we talking about the, the penetration of the veil? Okay, the penetration of the veil is another very, very important law of one concept, which again gets back to personality transparency and going from a seeker to an adept. In order to go from a seeker to an adept, you must penetrate the veil. Now, what is the veil? The veil is this illusionary reality that is created by the cosmic consciousness of the universe and by the galactic logos, which is Jesus. Jesus is the galaxy. Jesus is the sun. Okay, and we're going to see the breath of Christ, the 11-year sunspot cycle, in part two of this whole show that I'm doing. So this is just going to be a part one philosophical preliminary. So the penetration of the veil, what does that really mean? It's talking about the idea that there is a veil between your conscious and your subconscious mind. If you want to understand law of one cosmology, the universe started out without evil. There was no possibility of any being thinking that it wasn't unified with the one infinite creator. And you say, well, heck, that sounds pretty amazing. That sounds great. Why wouldn't we want everybody to be online with the cosmic consciousness? Well, the universe designed a series of seven densities specifically so that there are grades of evolution that we have to work through. The basic idea of the universe is the one infinite creator starts out as a cosmic infinity. It then wants to create a series of, of cosmic co-creator beings who work together with it to manifest what we think of as physical reality. And that physical reality is not true. <laughs> it's an illusion. It's a dance of consciousness. The only real truth is that we made all this from our own mind, and there is only one mind. As you become aware that there's only one mind, you gain personality transparency, and you begin to have the abilities of the adept, which will include telepathy, precognition, bilocation, and telekinesis. This is the destiny. And now the earth is much like a tree in which the tree is ripening and the fruit has come to its fruition. Fruition, fruit, you see what I did there? Anyway, <laughs> at this point, what we're doing is we're fruiting as a planet. It is now ready for us to go into fourth density. The negative is being exposed. I expect that we're going to see some very big changes pretty soon. I expect we're going to see arrests and tribunals. And it's all part of the solar cycle that we're in, which I was telling you about last year. Last year, I said that the hardest burn was going to continue through the end of this year. And as we go into part two, which again, I'm not going to disrespect you by trying to do four or five hours today. I think that's another thing that frankly is the result of my mind being too obsessive and not in this blank slate, this virginal mind that they were talking about. So you penetrate the veil by realizing what the veil is. The veil is this lie that says that you don't have unity with God. That's not true. It never was true. And it was designed that way so that you would get sad and then go in one of two directions. Either you get so sad that you're like, that's it. I just want to kill people and drink blood and, I'm, you know, and rape and molest. That's my, that's my goal in life. Or you decide, hey, you know, other people are me. There's really no difference. I don't want them to feel bad because I don't want to feel bad. And that's when you're really figuring it out. And that's when you get back to, as it says here, the all-compassionate love that demands no return, which is only the fourth level. It goes higher than that. In the fifth level, you become wise and you don't just give everything away for nothing. Okay. 
If this path is followed, the higher energy centers shall be activated and crystallized until the adept is born. And somebody said they cannot find personality transparency online. Okay, so let's talk about this for a second. Uh, you can go to lawofone.info. This site was actually designed by the physicist Dr. Bruce Perrette, who is also known as Daniel and worked at Montauk. Yes, it's the same guy. I've said this recently. So lawofone.info is the site. And then you can start doing keyword searches and you can type in things like the word personality, the word transparency. It gets very confusing. There's a lot of different ways you can customize your search. You can click on any, all, or phrase. Uh, any means that you get any of the words in your search result. All means that all the words are included somewhere in the paragraph. And then phrase means that the phrase personality transparency is there. Now, I've already done that. I've already looked for personality transparency and I've already pulled some of the best Law of One quotes for you, which we're reading here now. So again, if this path of compassionate love is followed, the higher energy centers will be activated and crystallized until the adept is born. For those who think that they can make it on the left-hand path, the Law of One says you really can't go beyond fifth density and maybe the very, very, very beginning of sixth density. You have to leave the negativity behind to keep evolving or your soul literally dissolves back into the background energy of the universe. And then it has to get broken up and a bunch of different people are created who all have to experience karma in order to work off all the horrible things that you did. So yes, very, very evil people will have their souls divided into several new incarnations just to get all the karma in of the things that they've done. Within the adept is the potential for dismantling the veil to a greater or lesser extent, at which time all may be seen again as one. The other self is the primary catalyst in this particular path to the piercing of the veil, if you would call it that. Man, oh man, David is on fire. I seriously want to say I love you, David Wilcox. Do not let cynical, inept folks affect your intelligent flow, bro. You walk. You rock, and nobody talks like we talk. You rock. What's with the long hair? It's been a forced dive. I literally, figuratively, now I see more every moment that our studies supersede. Thank you. I could use a couple more hours, LOL, for real. I don't know if everybody wants a couple more hours, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. Typically, I, I kind of have come to find out, yeah, the three-hour, four-hour video is probably not the best. Um... Anyway, let's go back to this quote, because what does it say here? It says, the other self is the primary catalyst for piercing the veil in this particular method. Now, what does that actually mean? It means the design of the universe is for you to interact with other people and then to be triggered by them. That's catalyst. Catalyst is negative experience. And so... The Law of One encourages you to be as social as possible. They don't want you to hang out with the same people in the same town with the same job for your whole life. If that's the way that you're living your life, you're probably not going to get that enlightened. You're probably not going to have a whole lot of growth. The more people you can interact with, the more you can get yourself out there, even if it's just online. And again, they talk about this principle of the mirror so much that others represent the mirror. Others mirror you back to yourself. The whole freaking thing that's going on in the world right now, to me, has a lot to do with Barack Obama and the fact that he has a black parent and a white parent. Honest to God, I really do believe this. He, he is seeing racism because of things like 45 going after him publicly, and he's projected that out into the world. He believed that we were still in the Jim Crow era, and the mainstream media pushed this on us, but we're really not. As I said before, I, I chilled with black guys from Harlem. I smoked cannabis with them, 420, blunts, white owl, Philly blunt. I, I learned raps, okay? I learned KRS-One, Guru, De La Soul, EPMD. Good morning, Mr. Bozak. Time to wake up the nuts. Co what? Co hit the shower so I could wash the butt. Damn, last night was crazy wood life. I had a blast. It was ass for days. I needed a full tank of gas. Golly, G would pee to Sigridi, pussy kick a lot of them. I can't even go through the rest of that stuff. I did it all, okay? I did the, 
I did that stuff. And I enjoyed hanging out with those people. I've never been a racist. I don't even understand this. Okay, so like, it's not real. It's an illusory reality, and other selves are the catalyst to piercing the veil. So look what's happening with other selves right now. There are two lines of reality in the world. There's two realities that you can believe in. And now I'm giving you a virginal third mind that's different than the two realities that you get to choose from. In one reality, you are believing everything that they tell you. And you can't understand why things are so crazy and you can't understand. And look at what's happening. Those people who want to live in that denial are being battered. They are being battered by experience. They are being battered by information. They are being battered by consciousness. And they are seeing all of these things come in to their reality, whether they like it or not. Now, a lot of times, those of us in the truth community say, we don't understand why people can't con conceptualize such simple things. This is simple information. It's so easy to understand. Why can't you understand something that's so easy? Please try to have more compassion for these people who are suffering and understand that it has nothing to do with the simplicity, cognitively, of the concept. The concept is very simple. Very evil people are running the planet and want to kill you, okay? And they're trying to do that and they're aggressively pursuing this goal right now. That's a very simple thing if you were just looking at it like a mathematics problem. Yeah, okay, evil world... They're trying to control everybody. They want to kill everybody. Let's just hypothetically postulate a reality where that's what it is. It's not difficult to think of the idea that the world could be like this. Cognitively, you could have a thought experiment. Anyone could theoretically be a philosopher and say, well, I don't believe this and it makes me scared and it makes me feel unsafe. But hypothetically, theoretically, maybe perhaps just in case, what if... This is so freaking effed that we are like really in the, the crap here. What if it's real? It's not about whether it's easy to see it or not. And it's not about whether it's easy to understand. The process of understanding requires a maturation that the galactic logos wants you to have. Your maturation is the awakening that you are in a hero's journey, that there is a huge villain and you better get off your ass and fight him before he kills you. That's the tipping point. That's what's so hard to understand. The alchemy of the galaxy, the alchemy of Jesus Christ, is that you will become like him. John 14, 12. As I do these things, so shall you do them and greater things. Cognitive abilities, psychic abilities, telepathy, Seeing the future, all of these things are rolled in with that concept. So when we're looking at the possibility of liberating ourselves from the suffering that so many people have, it ultimately comes with the understanding that you cannot die. You cannot die. You are not threatened by anything. You have nothing to worry about. And this whole entire world, as traditional as it seems to be, is actually a, re a reality construct. That's the awakening. That's why people have a hard time seeing something that, oh, it's so simple. Why can't they see it? It's such an easy thing to understand. No, it's a paradigm shift. It's coming to realize that everything you ever thought was true in your life is a freaking lie. You were lied to about every single thing. There are satanic communities where everybody's in on it. It's the YMCA. It's the bank. It's the schools. It's the colleges. And they have mind control where you don't know they did anything. And they do it so well that you can't remember that they did anything. Most of the children in those movies don't remember Starring in the movie, folks. These are some of the new briefings I'm getting. Hypnosis is a lot scarier than I thought, and it's been used a lot more than I thought. 
And so many, many victims are not aware that anything ever even happened to them. And I don't mean to alarm you. I don't mean to alarm you. But it appears that this crap happened to me. It appears that I was in a dialed-in satanic community, and it appears that I was abused. And that's one of the main things I've had to deal with over the last few months, is the torture that I was put through. The things that I was forced to witness, the, the Draco's eating human beings. And Draco's eating my own body, okay? One of the things I discovered, which is very weird, is that some of the technology they got in UFO disclosure, they could literally chop your head off and then zip you right back together and bring you back to life like nothing even happened. So there are some sickos who had children get eaten alive and then resuscitate their body from the dead. And that's what apparently was done to me, among other things. And it explains why I had these horrific dreams, this repetitive dream I had my whole life as a kid of a dog eating the, the fingers off of my hand. And now I know why. All right? I have a personal stake in getting rid of these things because they abused me. And I am not happy about it. And if you think this is fake and you want to laugh at me, and you think that I'm making up abuse memories and that this shit didn't really happen to me, I'm sorry if you can't believe that there could be a reality where this is happening, but I've been getting new briefings, folks. And a lot of the stuff about the secret space program is true. The ETs do have a technology where they can stitch in and out of time. They could pick you up. They could have a long set of experiences with you for however long, some of which may be very horrific things, very disgusting things and bring you back, and you don't know any different. And if you read Ascension Mysteries, the first half of that book, which is all my personal reflections, why was I waking up under hypnosis? Why was I walking out the door of my house in the middle of the night, hundreds of times as a child, and I couldn't remember where I was going? And at the end of the thing, they just make me walk back to where I was, and then the memory is lost. And I don't remember what happened, but now I do. Now I do. And I want revenge. I do. I'm not going to lie to you. I want revenge. I want these people gone. I want these beings gone. They shouldn't be able to torture people like this. They shouldn't be able to do things to children like what they did to me. And the things that I'm now remembering that happened to me. I'm sorry, this is, I shouldn't be crying like this, I'm sorry. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe that these things happened to me, that's okay. But I want to be clear that it did, and I want to get back to the slides so we can talk about uh, where this is going. So... This is a really, really big one, okay? This is the one that also, again, explains why did I have to, you know, drop out on you guys for a little while? Why was it difficult? I had no idea that I was involved in this crap, folks. I had no idea that I was forced to witness ceremonies, but it makes sense because of why I've been so pursuing this for so long. How the hell are they able to do this and not have you remember? It's, it's amazing. I really have had a lot to process. But I now feel that in my, in my other life, in my waking life, I've, of course, lived it with, with perfection. I've never wanted to be evil at all. And these things were done to me against my will. The people who molested me did so against my will. They did it on stage. They did it in front of large audiences. And they were making fun of me because I had special abilities in this ultimate personality that they created. I had telekinesis. And so if you go back to some of the dreams that I posted online in 1997, there's a dream where I'm in my school cafeteria and everyone in the audience is in a robe. And they all have their way with me, make me make them a banana sandwich. And I didn't realize when I wrote that dream down that it was true, but that I couldn't remember because the memories were taken away from me. But now I do. Now I remember. I don't want to go into this a whole lot more. 
but it explains why I've been so committed to my path of justice and freedom. Why will not let this go on? Why do not support these people? I did not deserve to go through what I went through. I did not deserve to be raped. And I will not stop. I don't care what happens to me anymore, folks. Now that I know what they did, I don't care. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they say about me. This has got to stop. We need this thing to end. We need these people to stop succeeding in what they're doing. And we need their overlords to stop gaining the louche energy, of torture, the ceremonies that they make people go through and the horrible things that they make people do. The people who are in these organizations, for the most part, do not want this. They do not want to be doing these things, folks. They do not want to participate in these ceremonies. And they would, there would be a mass exodus, according to Savali. There would be a mass exodus if they felt they could leave and not be tortured. And so believe me, there's a lot of people who you might think are really sad about the loss of this, and they're not sad at all. What a relief it will be to not have to go through ceremonies anymore. What a relief it will be to not be abused by your higher-ups anymore. This is profound, okay? So as you start to become aware, you know, when, when the veil drops, when you realize that this world is an illusion, it's becoming a lot easier to see that now. They've made it obvious. They're, they're not hiding their agenda, okay? And I have been staunchly opposed to this the entire time. Nobody should have to go through the things that I seem to be remembering having happened to me. Nobody should ever have to go through this crap. So, as you go farther and farther down your path, and people are saying, oh my God, I'm crying, let it out, we will love you. My heart center aches, my goodness, such pure evil. Yeah, I mean, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to keep crying, but I had a time loop in 1997 that made me be aware that I was ritually abused. And uh, it explains why I've always read this stuff and why when I saw these descriptions that I would feel such vivid things. Uh, I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel bad about the fact that this happened to me per se. But I absolutely do not want to ever go through this again. And I will not go through this again. And under no circumstances will I permit this to happen to me again. I want you to be safe. I'm doing this for you. If I get killed, it's okay. I mean, I don't want them to, and I doubt that Michael would let them, but... Now that I found out what happened to me and how they messed me up and why I've had personality disorders my whole life, why I've had a hard time on many different levels and why I've, I've felt this like I'm burning alive. Well, if you have trauma in your subconscious and you can't remember what it was, if they don't allow you to remember what happened to you, and this happens in the course of traumatic memories anyway. I mean, if, you, if something bad happens to you, you're going to dissociate it into some corner of your mind, okay? It's not a bad thing that I'm crying right now, and it's not a bad thing that I'm sad, and it's not a bad thing ultimately if these things happen to me either, because I now know that I will fight to the last breath I have to keep you safe, to keep this planet safe, so that you don't have to go through what I went through. Because in the future, they want to do this to a lot more people, not just folks like me who were smart and they did some strange thing with us. Okay? This is a big subject. And the time loop really helped me to see something that was very important. So I needed to step away. I, you can't heal and be creative at the same time. You can't be fighting this war and get better and become an adept, you see. You need the silence. And so that's why, getting back to the slide, that I had to free myself from the thoughts, constraint, the thoughts, constraints, opinions, and bonds of other people, which unfortunately includes you guys in the audience, and I am sorry. But when you start finding out that people made you into a banana sandwich, 
and you start remembering those things, you got to take some time off. It was much, much bigger than the divorce. So don't think that the divorce is why I was so silent. The divorce was only the catalyst that triggered these memories. Once the memories came, I had to sit with them. I had to process them. I had to say, did this actually really happen to me? Is it even possible that this might be true? And I still don't really know. The verdict is out, but I, I've spoken with my therapist about it, and she has told me that the drawings and the writings and the dreams and all the things that I have strongly suggest repressed memory. Well, that's what happens when you're smart. If you're a gifted child like I was, they may actually pull you into something and never, ever, ever tell you what the hell was going on. Okay? It's very sad. So I had to pull myself away. I had to be quiet for a while. But I think I'm mostly through it now because I've come to an acceptance. And if I had to go through all these things on some parallel reality to make me into the warrior that I am today, then I accept. As horrific as those things were, as disgusting as those things were, they made me into who I am, and they will never change who I am. And I cannot be defeated because I am immortal, because I have consciousness. The simple fact that I have consciousness leads to immortality, and that immortality means that I am not jeopardized. There's nothing I have to worry about. And no matter what these people did to me or to my body, it doesn't matter. I survived. I'm alive. And now I get to do something good with my life. Now I get to do something positive with my life. So they talk about this concept of freedom, and they say that it's going to piss people off. So look at this. This freedom is seen by those not free as what you would call evil or black. The magic is recognized, but the nature often is not. Woo! Now that's one of the ones that can really, really make people... Uncomfortable. Wait a minute. It's, it's a lot simpler than you think. What it means is that if you pull away from other people because you need to heal, and they say that's spiritually acceptable, right? Pulling away is acceptable. I mean, if you have a family and children, I don't recommend walking off on them. That's ridiculous. I'm not saying that, oh, well, I need to be an addict now, so I got to ditch my kids. That's now you're into something called honor slash duty in the law of one, which means that if you have children, you're responsible for them until they're 18 at least. So that's something you can't get around. You can't just ditch out on your kids and become an adept, all right? So don't think that you can because you will not make it. If you have children, then your adepthood is in the context of being their parent. That's a very, very important point. So when you're free, when you have this freedom, you don't care what other people think. And then they can't believe how this could be possible. How is it possible that you could defy me and defy my will and defy my authority? That's what happened. Well, you're evil, you're evil, you're evil. No, I'm actually evolving and I'm in a higher consciousness. And so this is what's happening on planet Earth with the cabal. We, the voice of the public or vox populi, to use the Latin term, we are not racists. We are not all wanting to change our gender. We are not all wanting to change our sexual orientation. It's fine if you're homosexual. That's fine. It's fine if you identify as something other than your birth gender. That's fine. What's not okay is forcing yourself upon other people, forcing your ideologies, your dreams, your visions, your view of how the world should work on to everyone else. That's the difference between love and control. If you love people, you give them freedom and you allow them to read information that they might not then agree with you about. They might say, hey, I don't, I don't like you anymore after reading this. Well, that's freedom. They have the freedom to read that, even if it means that they don't like you anymore. You can't stop them from reading things that will lead them to not liking you. Well, you can. But in terms of universal law, now we're getting back to the organic law of the U.S. Constitution that goes back to why our founding fathers wrote this in the first place and something most people don't understand, which is color of law. The color of law represents the underlying trend of how the world sees various beliefs. And when enough people believe a certain way that this is right and this is wrong, that becomes color of law. 
It's the idea of rightness. It's the idea of justice. It's the organic concept of law stripped away from humans and even stripped away from life on earth. Is there an organic law unique to the universe? And the answer is yes. According to the law of one, it's free will. Free will is the law of the universe, and that law is always going to be preserved. So if you violate somebody's free will, you're going to get bad karma, and that's going to be something that you have to deal with, okay? So I'm not telling you that you have to run and hide, and I'm not telling you that you have to be afraid of the power that is within you. That power is always there, and you have everything you need to reconstruct the universe. The freedom can come in walking away from those who insist that they are right. And that is what we are doing as a planet right now. Since, again, I studied dysfunctional battering relationships in college, what's happening on a global level is that we are in a domestic violence relationship and we are leaving the abuser and we are saying no more. And on the way out, the abuser is trying to destroy us, destroy our lives, take all of our money, leave us for dead. That's what's going on right now. It's a breakup. It's a global equivalent of a breakup. And it's very interesting that the Johnny Depp trials, which again, statistically is the most commonly viewed content on earth right now. These are like a warm up for the tribunals. This is where it's going. So getting back to the slide once again, I would say that healing is an elective process. And what does that mean? That means that we choose to heal. We choose to become the Logos. We choose to work on being an adept and arriving at personality transparency. And what's happening is that as heroes form on Earth, the whole point of the, the soul's journey is the hero's journey. The 22 archetypes defined by the major arcana of the Tarot cards, which the Law of One says do represent... <laughs> the 22 phases of our human spiritual journey in this galaxy, those archetypes are available and we all have to go through them. They're, we all have to learn how to work the 22 archetypes and the process of working them is called the hero's journey. That's what it's called. So the hero's journey represents the, the awakening to the fact that there is a villain and that there is a quest and that you, in order to defeat the villain, must take on the quest and become the hero. The whole point of life on Earth is to generate heroes at the end of this cycle in particular. Heroism is the salvation from third density. Becoming a hero, doing the right thing, standing up for the oppressed, fighting against injustice, this is heroic. This is the definition of the hero. And so as we're doing this, we also find out that the, the ancient prophecies spoke of this as well. So now I'm going to tie in some Hinduism. So check this out. This is very interesting. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, again, which I believe this is from ETs, and they're talking about personality transparency in this passage. This, I believe, is the same being as Christ speaking, same being as Jesus, just in a different form. I have been born many times, and many times have you been born. But I remember my past lives, because again, he's got some degree of personality transparency, probably not as much as Jesus, but, you know, logoic consciousness. I remember my past lives, and you have forgotten yours. Although I am, because this is, again, speaking as the I am, the cosmic I am presence, or the Christ consciousness. Although I am unborn, everlasting, and I am the Lord of all, I come to my realm of nature, and through my wondrous power, I am born. When righteousness is weak and faints, and unrighteousness exalts in pride, then my spirit arises on earth for the salvation of those who are good, for the destruction of evil in man, for the fulfillment of the kingdom of righteousness, I come to this world in the ages that pass. And so what they're actually saying here is that the Logos embodies to ensure that the cycle is completed. We essentially are the working end of the prophecy, folks. It's the same thing in Hinduism. It's the same thing in Zoroastrianism. And remember, the priests that predicted Jesus' arrival were Zoroastrian priests. 
the myrrh, the frankincense, and the gold were their gifts for the Messiah. And in Zoroastrianism, the Messiah is called the Saushiant. When they saw that light that led them to Bethlehem, they knew what they were going to find. They knew they were going to find the Saushiant. And so in the Zoroastrian tradition, they say that at the end of the age, we become Saushiants, we become adepts. We become fourth density activated. And this again gets back to the law of one and the concept of your fourth dimensional ghost body, which is again, incredibly fascinating. So uh, I'm going to skip ahead here and we're going to do the solar cycle thing later on. Uh, that'll be part two. But before we do the solar cycle thing, I, uh, I want to get into this. This is going to be the last little section for today. I've said this before, <clears throat> but uh, as a result of what's happening in the world, my work with the aerospace company, and we are, as I've said, if you've watched any of my other stuff, the U.S. military has declassified patents for working spaceships that use anti-gravity and power plants that generate what we would think of as free energy. This has already been disclosed. And I have a company that I've put together which intends to build those patents. And that's where all my money went. So uh, this is why, again, I have to do a paid product this year because I need more income. Because I took all my income and I put it towards our mutual future where we all get to live better than the billionaires are living right now. That's what I want for everyone. And we get there in part by building our way out, using the technology that these higher beings gave us UFO crashes, putting all that stuff together, and using it to heal the biosphere and heal the planet. Now, for many years, ever since I was age two, I had these dreams of a man who looked like Obi-Wan Kenobi after I saw Star Wars, and he was always there for me. I call him the old man. I would meet with him in UFOs. These dreams involved spaceships, and he seemed to be very powerful. And he told me I was going to have a very important role on the planet in the future. And he basically gave me a whole bunch of teachings that prepared me for what's going on right now. Also, I was made aware that I have DNA from these people in my body and that many of us do. In fact, the reason I had these fevers all throughout my childhood over and over again, apparently, is that viruses were being used to allow more of this benevolent ET human DNA to get in because the virus invades the cell and then you get more DNA in there. Now, I was actually told by Archangel Michael in these telepathic communications we've been discussing that they jacked me up with more of this DNA than most people ever are able to have. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised because of the IQ that I have, which is obviously high, and the predilection that I have towards spirituality and the telepathy, the abilities that I've demonstrated. These are all signs that my DNA has been uh, souped up, and I think a lot of us have had this. In, in 1981, the Law of One said there were 65 million wanderers on Earth. But what I didn't really understand was how all of this ties back in with the so-called Valiant Thor information. So, uh, this is very, very exciting, and I do now remember having spoken to Pete Peterson and, and him telling me that Valiant Thor was real, uh, we just never really made a big deal out of it. Now, I was always looking for Venus because Venus is the planet that in the Law of One they say they originated from. The Law of One came out in 1981. It's five written books, and you cannot deny that they predicted in advance many, many highly advanced scientific concepts that we still have trouble even believing are true today and have been the core material, multiple books that I've written, and so many television shows, movies, and videos that I've created and radio shows over the years. Now, all of this Law of One material, again, was derived telepathically, and we never really understood where the source was except that they said they came from Venus. 
Dr. Pete Peterson has always been one of my top insiders, and I would ask him, what do you guys know about Venus? What did you get on the inside about Venus? The only thing he would ever tell me is that he believed that there were a certain number of android humans that we built in the military industrial complex that live on the surface of Venus, and that was about it. It wasn't until this very strange event has taken place where insiders like those on the team that I'm working with in our aerospace company are now being told that they can say everything. You have to understand, the CEO of my aerospace company has hardly ever told me anything about what he went through, even though it's very similar to Pete Peterson. Well, all of a sudden, there's been some kind of policy change, and you put that in capital letters, policy change is a really big deal. The policy change is that now we can say everything. Now we can disclose everything. So if you go to thedisclosure.com, I have that movie where I'm showing you the prototype of a device that takes four AA batteries and you get 750 volts out of it. If you want to see free energy working, go to thedisclosure.com, watch the movie, you will see it. I figured out a way to edit the video where I didn't give away the guy's face or voice by taking out the audio and making sure you never see his face. I was able to get this information out there. We are going to have technology that will eliminate our need for fossil fuel, will eliminate our need to pay for energy. And it's happening a lot sooner than we think. And that's what my company is working on. And that's why I'm so motivated to do this. And again, the people on the inside are now being told that they can fully disclose not just some of the information they know, but all of the information they know. So one of the things that we're going to have to find out is that everything that was taking place in space is, is ridiculously evil. If you got pulled into space, if you were part of the secret space program, almost guaranteed you had to go through ceremonies. Almost guaranteed. And I'm sorry to say this, and it's a bummer, but it's true. Okay, this is some of the stuff I'm learning. They have the technology where they can chop your head off and they can put you back together so they could torture you and kill you and bring you back to life. And it's still the same horror that you went through, as if you had actually died. And now you have that trauma. And now you have strange traumatic memories and you don't know why, okay? But there's a positive side to all this. This had to be allowed to happen. These negative people had to be allowed to invade and create this control system because it's all part of the grand illusion that we awaken out of, the grand dance of consciousness that makes us souls. So, Pete, what's going on with Venus? What's going on with Venus? And he would never give me anything. Well, now that we're getting full disclosure, all of a sudden, even though Pete never told me this except in passing, now Valiant Thor has become a really, really big deal. Because the biggest piece of information that I did not have until now is that these beings were appearing as humans. And they came to Earth and one of them who called himself Valiant, and Thor is like a last name that they all have the same last name. Valiant came in 1957 and apparently lived as a human being in the Pentagon for three years. And as I started to connect the dots and realize that the Valiant Thor phenomenon is the same as Archangel Michael, is the same as the Law of One, is the people that have been contacting me, is the 1950s human ETs that contacted people in America, contacted people in Italy. Now everything starts to make sense. Everything starts to make sense. Now, if you want to know about Valiant Thor, there is a book you can find called Stranger at the Pentagon, and this captures the narrative. Uh, this is the book, and again, you don't have to pay for it. It is available online for free. I mean, I would recommend paying the artist, but you don't have to. It's a pretty short book. Now, believe it or not, as, as crazy as this may seem, this guy who you're seeing here, as well as the two people that are sitting next to him, they are apparently not regular humans. They projected into human form, but if you saw them in their native form, they would be orbs of light who live inside the planet Venus. This is the new briefing that I received, and it sounds crazy, but it makes a lot of sense. And so... So many people get angry and arrogant when it comes to UFOs, right? And so you look at this, I don't like him. I don't trust him. That can't be an extraterrestrial. And look at the guy next to him. He looks like just an ordinary dude, right? Well, <laughs> as it turns out, apparently this is the guy. Apparently this is Valiant Thor, and he did show up. 
in a very normal-looking human body. And so if you look at the left there, uh, let me move my microphone here, sorry for a second. I just bumped it. If you look at the left there, it appears that E.T. humans might look somewhat like Christina Applegate. <laughs> okay, that's pretty cool. I, I, I certainly don't have a problem with that. And the guy in the middle, it's interesting. They don't look anything different. Uh, here's another photograph from the day that they apparently arrived, and she's smiling. You know, everything looks pretty normal here. Now, a lot of people might not believe this, and I might not have either, except that this is stuff that I now got in briefings telling me, no, this is really true. So the, the line that I heard and the line that's in the book, The Stranger at the Pentagon, is that he arrived in 1957 in a flying saucer, so-called Bellcraft. And they also use this term Bellcraft in the Law of One. Now, typically, when we think of a bell today, we probably think of a church bell. It's kind of long, right? That's not really the bell that they meant you to be thinking about. The visual on the bell in the Law of One is apparently misunderstood because the bell that they wanted you to see is actually this, folks. That looks a lot more familiar in terms of UFOs and designs that people have been very familiar with. So again, Thor was considered a last name, and even though they look alike to humans, they had noticeable physiological differences, which the people in our government got really, really excited about studying. His heart was larger than a normal human being's, enough so that it didn't seem possible. He had one single gigantic lung instead of two lungs. That's very weird, right? He had blood with copper oxide in it, much like an octopus, instead of it being like human blood, which is, uh, which is iron oxide. The IQ was off the scale. They estimated his IQ to be 1,200. He could basically talk about anything with incredible genius. He was fluent in 100 different languages, including extraterrestrial. So again, you can say this is all BS. You can be a skeptic. You can cross your arms, sit back in your chair, and put your head back and forth like this, and make noises, and well, whatever it is that you need to do to feel good about yourself because I'm threatening your paradigm and you don't like new information that might just be true. Okay, but imagine what it would be like if this guy is in the Pentagon and you're sitting there and you bring in somebody who speaks Spanish and he can speak fluently. And you bring in somebody who speaks Mandarin and he speaks fluently. And you bring in somebody who speaks Portuguese and he speaks fluently. And you bring in somebody who speaks Mongolian and he speaks with them fluently. And it doesn't matter what accent it is, what language it is, all over the world. You bring them in and he can talk to them. And you're watching it happen. And then you test his body and you x-ray his body and you look at him under the scanner and it's like, whoa, he's only got one lung, he's got this weird heart, he's got copper oxide blood, he's got incredible IQ. This is incredible. Imagine what these guys, and apparently he told them that he had a 490-year lifespan, but he looked, again, like a normal human being, 6 feet and 185 pounds. I really did not ascribe significance to the Valiant Thor thing before, but now that I did, it started to make me realize, you know, if he spent three years in the Pentagon and Howard Hughes had just written this five-inch binder called The Plan, which was his outline of how to defeat the deep state, wouldn't it make sense that Archangel Michael slash Valiant Thor would create the plan that we're now seeing come to fruition and created the plan with the knowingness of what they as angels could do on the other side of the veil to make sure that the plan is fulfilled. Part of their plan seemed to be generating the law of one, and part of their plan seemed to be getting me involved so that I would be able to show you all these things and how they connect, importantly, at the right time, so that you have greater faith in what's going on here. So now that we've gotten all this Valiant Thor stuff, it very much seems to tie into the Law of One, which grew out of the human ET contactee data from the 1950s. We'll talk about this in the next show on more depth, in which, again, in the Law of One, telepathic verbal information was generated with remarkable accuracy, and there were many attempts made before Valiant approached the U.S. in 1957. Now, I'm going to jump ahead one more time, just let me do this for a second while I get to the place I wanted to go.
Okay. Good enough. So, uh, the 1950s ET contacts, I'm not really going to go into a whole lot of detail about that now because we're already, again, really pretty far. We're past uh, the two-hour mark. So, um, somebody said Valiant Thor is on Venus now and wants nothing to do with humans. That is not true. Valiant Thor is very, very interested in, in our survival, and that's what they're working on, and they will never stop. So... The Law of One was a big, big part of this, and again, it's been my main source of spiritual wisdom since 96, and then it led to my own contact in 96 November, so 11 months later, approximately, I began having a telepathic interaction with a source that said it was Archangel Michael. It used analogies of the flaming sword, uh, and of course, I've now seen a few different references where he uses the word valiant. So in the time loop from 1997, it's become clear now that Valiant Thor, Law of One, it's all interconnected. Um, very, very clear. So as I said, there's this amazing new prophetic book that I hope you all go, you're all going to get, uh, The Michael Prophecies. And at first it was just 1999, but now I've discovered by going through more of the transcripts from 96 through 2000, as I was pulling in all this telepathic information, speaking the words of Archangel Michael every day, not being aware of what they say, trying to get my mind away from it, not paying any attention to it. And if you do it right, then you start getting future prophecies. What I really didn't understand is that all of the transcripts, 96 through 2000, are loaded with references to COVID, to vaccines, to you name it. I mean, it's amazing. All of the connections of the stuff that's happening now Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, the war in Afghanistan, you know, the, the, the fact that they dropped the ball on that and, and, and that all the weapons were seized, all of these amazing different things that have been going on are all linked up in the book. And I put red line, uh, I highlight the text in red when those things happen. So this is, this is, again, really the core quote that I think is the most significant out of all the Michael prophecies. Uh, where they say that we are going to have a coup over the military-industrial complex and, most importantly, its stranglehold over the UFO cover-up. So I've already published the October through December 1999 prophecies in the previous YouTube videos that I've done here, and the remainder of 1999 is being converted into at least two volumes now because I have 487 single-space commentary pages but there's no commentary there. The team reviewed the manuscript and they said that the passages are too puzzling and I need interpretations. So then I was looking for an introduction to the book, which I've now found. I, I, I knew that at one point Archangel Michael did kind of introduce himself. This one is not in the, in the version that I gave the Alliance. I found it in 1997 and I added it in at the beginning. But in the course of looking for it, I stumbled into a new time loop this was in early April. So April is when my life really started to get very strange with the memories of traumatic abuse, with telekinesis, all these strange things were happening, okay? Uh, they began happening far more often. And what actually triggered all this, believe it or not, was Donald John Trump getting a hole in one at 187 yards. People don't even want to believe this. They're mad at him. They don't like it. They're like, well, how in the world? It's not even possible. 187 yards, you swing at a ball that's like this big, and it falls into the hole? Come on. Come on. But then look at what we see here. Ernie Els, who is a golf pro, was wearing his contact lenses when Trump made the hole-in-one, and he said he saw it clearly. Well, guess what? This was the result of a psychic working with all the golf pros, including Ernie Els, who, was, who were there with Trump that day. And, and Archangel Michael says, as I've said before, that Trump lenses other people's work into a work product. That is, that is what he's really, really great at. And it's, it's obviously taken this Great Awakening thing to a whole new level. That, that underlying ability is phenomenal. And so um, I didn't actually like him in the beginning, frankly, and I have he has earned my full respect, appreciation, honor, loyalty, and support because I'm doing the same thing. It would be easy for me to do one more launch, take your money, run away from you, live in this house, in this beautiful place, 
and never have to worry about money and never have to take a risk and just live alone and do nothing. Okay, I could do that. I could have enough money that I could do nothing. But instead, I took my money and I invested in hover cars and power plants and garbage technology. And I'm going to continue earning because I want to be out there. I don't want to run away. But in the course of, of this adept process and, and getting into the monastery, which is what the time loop calls this house, they definitely said they wanted me in a monastery. They wanted me at 8,600 feet. They wanted me on the mountaintop, the pyramid type of house, because, you know, the log cabin home has no metal, so you get the pyramid power. <coughs> the same thing that happens if you stay in the Great Pyramid is what's happening in this house, especially because I'm up in the mountains. Same thing that happens to the Tibetans that are meditating in the Himalayas at 8,000, 9,000 foot altitude. You meditate on empty awareness. The self is creator, okay? So I'm having all these things going on. I start having this time loop in 1997, which includes the memory that I was abused. And I'm okay with it now. I mean, it's, it, it, it didn't happen to me at all in my normal life. And if they do this amnesia thing, it's like a parallel lifetime. And I'm, I'll go into that on a different show. But anyway, getting back to the executive function, I said, look, there is no way, I'm sorry, Don, or Mr. President, <laughs> there's no way that you could have pulled this off without supernatural help. It's just not, it doesn't ring right. And yet, how did it get in the hole? How did it happen? Well, the answer is telekinesis. And so apparently, we, we all know there's been multiple attempts on his life, and they're not going to work because whether, whether we can control it or not is another story. So executive function means that you will be protected from, from assassination if you are out there on the front lines as a hero doing something to help humanity get through this horrible problem that we're in which has led to this tipping point of peak global crisis, which everybody is so afraid of right now. Okay, that's where we're at. So when this happened to 45, I said, whoa, he is starting to develop abilities that he probably didn't have before. And this is very interesting and very curious. And then simultaneously, all these very, very interesting and at times incredibly disturbing telekinetic events started to happen to me. So I know you might not want to believe me, but during early April, it started to happen two or three times a day. Now, I'm not saying that it's like a, that it's like a physical glass is moving across. just It's not that kind of stuff. One of the things that's weird and annoying about this is that it's always threshold. It's like, well, yeah, it moved, but... Mm, did I do that? Was it intentional? Did it happen on purpose? I don't know. Things are moving, yeah. But it's not like it's floating in the air. It's not, it's, it's small stuff. It's like, like one of the ones recently was I looked at a log, I was packing up logs for, for the fire because we had a snowstorm here a week ago. And I had packed up all the logs onto the, the cart that I'm going to wheel it into the house with. And I said, you know, maybe I should pick up that one last piece of wood. I want to pick up that one last piece of wood, put it on top. And I say, I want to pick up that piece of wood. And then as I do, it moved by three inches by itself. It just goes, whoosh. Now, it fell downhill. So you could say, well, yeah, it fell downhill. But it fell downhill at exactly the moment that I said, I should pick that thing up. And I want to put it on the top of the cart. So there's a lot of these. And so the ones that were the scariest, honestly, was when I got a telepathic voice in my head corresponding with the movement of physical objects. And as I said before, this proved to be surprisingly upsetting. But the one that really got me screaming like a little girl, I'm not kidding, folks, shrieking, crying, was that I, I downloaded a, a free PDF copy of Stranger at the Pentagon, which I found on archive.org. Okay, it's there, Stranger at the Pentagon. Dot, Stranger at the Pentagon PDF. Just type that in, you'll find it. Well, I was reading the book again, and, and, I, and, I, and I know from what the briefings are, this is the most accurate book about the Valiant Thor story that's available. Okay, there's a lot of them that are out there that are really dubious, so just be careful if it says Valiant Thor, it doesn't mean it's real. There's a lot more detail to the Valiant Thor story than what you're going to get in Stranger at the Pentagon. 
and I intend to get more briefings on it. I want to learn a lot more about this because I really know very little. But I will tell you that uh, telekinesis and elements appear to be very interconnected. Wind, water are the two elements that seem to be the most related to telekinetic effects. Earth appears to be more about how you draw the telekinesis out of the Earth. And I'm going to talk about this in the Ascension Philosophy. I'm going to go in way more detail on the telekinesis exercises that Michael has been giving me telepathically. Uh, so, you know, take it or leave it, whether you believe that this is true. But if he wrote a book in 1999 that's telling the future now, he's probably telling me the truth about how to get your telekinesis to work too. Because it is actually getting results. I am getting it to work. I never, ever thought this would happen. I never thought I would be able to develop this ability unless I died and ascended into some angelic being. But apparently it's happening to me first because it's going to be happening to you later on. And I'm here to tell you how to get ready for it. So this was a very, very strange one where I was in the tub because another part of the thing is the telekinesis bathtub. <laughs> so the telekinesis bath is one of the things that Archangel Michael has been making me do. I have to take a bath. I cannot take a shower. I am forbidden to take a regular shower. I am supposed to bathe, and I'm supposed to bathe every day, but only in a bathtub. And then another one of the really funny things is that you have to pee in the bathtub. He wants your DNA in the water. So I have been using uh, scented oils. Um, there's a perfume company out there that has some really wonderful stuff. I recommend... Uh, I'm not going to say what it is. I recommend, let's just say, okay, well, this one is generic enough. Even if you just do sandalwood and eucalyptus, those to me seem to be two of the most activating because a lot of these compounds that smell really good have what are called sesquiterpenes, which are smell compounds that actually awaken your pineal gland. So sandalwood, definitely. Palo Santo, definitely. Eucalyptus, definitely. There's other ones that you can find. I would say just try it out and see what bath oils work for you. But uh, the, the peeing part apparently is important because it's getting your DNA outside your body into a medium that touches your skin, which gets into this whole inside out thing where you have to turn yourself inside out and become the universe. So apparently peeing in the bathtub is a good way to get you there. I don't know. I'm just following my instructions. I've noticed that there's an incredible amount of grief purging that goes on in the bathtub. Uh, every, almost every time I take a bath, I'm releasing pain and sadness. And, I, and also, at least in the earlier stages, he wants you to stay in the bathtub until all the water drains out. So you gotta, you gotta pull the freaking thing and then sit in there, wait for the tub to drain out. It's a pain in the ass. But uh, another big thing is that I've been healing my joints. And so when you're in the tub, if you have any issues with your joints where there's stiffness and pain, I've been doing rolfing very extensively. And it's all about finding the part of the range of motion that doesn't want to move. And then you fix that range of motion by actually working it. So it's similar to like physical therapy. And it turns out that I had enormous atrophy in my right leg. So another one of the things that Michael has been going into, and you're going to hear a lot more about this in Ascension Philosophy. This is the online course I'm going to be launching really pretty soon because it looks like with my aerospace work that I'm going to have to be doing a lot of meetings and a lot of traveling. And so this is probably one of the last times I'm going to be able to do Sunday teachings week after week without being interrupted. And it might even get to the point where I'm going to have to fly during the week and then come back to do the show. I don't know. But I'm going to try to get this thing knocked out really soon in the next few weeks, six-week course. So you wouldn't think that telekinesis would be so intricate, but here's another thing. Uh, Michael has told me now that you cannot have telekinesis work until the bindings in your muscle fibers are alleviated. Uh, and so it turns out that I had a very, very intense amount of scar tissue in my right leg that made my foot want to stick out to the side like this instead of going forward, that caused pain in certain parts of the range of motion, and it caused me to always want to stand in a funny way where I put my foot off to the side and walk in a funny way that people said was like a duck. 
how do you get your toes to turn inward? Well, it turns out that the whole entire interior area of my legs was all dead. The muscles weren't getting blood flow. And when they don't get blood flow, they can't heal and they can't grow and they can't contract. So most of the muscle in my leg wasn't even working. And it turns out that this was apparently intentional. They, they're telling, Michael is telling me now that I came in with such DNA upgrades, and a lot of you listening to this probably have had these too. You'll never know it because they do this all at night. And again, the positive beings don't torture you. This is more like a German paperclip kind of thing that I got sucked into as a result of living next door to General Electric, who was running Disney World, and had a contract to make all the animatronic machines down there, by the way. And they were building them all in Schenectady right across the street from my house. We're going to get into a lot more of that later. Why I think they're using animatronics and hypnosis together. And how they might torture people with animatronics and the people don't even realize that what they're seeing is not real, but prepares them for something later on that is real. you got to think about sick people and how they might do this kind of stuff. So... I found out from Michael that until I had gotten my leg uh, discarded, that it could bend and move easily without pain in the right range of motion, that I wouldn't have the telekinesis. So this is why in all the ancient cultures, the Taoists, the Buddhists, etc., that there's always a movement art. They're always doing these kind of interesting things with their hands, standing in funny ways. There's martial arts, there's Tai Chi, Qigong, all this kind of stuff apparently grows out of these cultures where they are tuning into cosmic consciousness, tuning into their higher selves, and there are physical movements that the body can make that actually help you make what the insiders have called plasmoids. So the whole focus of the art is in getting these balls to form, these plasma balls to form, which actually do have gravitational force and therefore can push people, they can move objects, they can levitate objects, you just have to get the ball. The ball lightning is really what it is. And they will form from your intent, but you have to be able to throw the energy and you have to have your muscle fibers unencumbered, which means if you have any muscle knots, you got to get rid of them or else this isn't going to work. So that means yoga. That means martial arts. That means Tai Chi, Chi, whatever it is, get your body all worked out so that you can stretch easily and comfortably with no pain, and so I've been working on this for years. And now that I'm just about done and I'm into like the very, very last part of my psoas muscle in my hip and the hip adductor a little bit, but that's really it. It's the psoas and the adductor and there's a little bit of atrophy in them, but it's almost gone. I have definitely noticed that as I get these knots out of my muscles that the telekinesis is going way up. And they're telling me you cannot get this to work if you don't do this. So you really do need to stretch out your body. So there's a good argument for yoga. Now, another part of the thing, as I was saying, is the elements. Telekinesis, as I found out, is very involved in elements. Uh, the element that Michael prefers to use the most to get large telekinesis to happen is wind. I have had an incredible number of very, very strange wind synchronicities going on where, for example, the wind will, will come in and hit just one window, but not the other windows. And it pounds the one window <sighs> right at the moment that it needed to pound it to make me go, oh, wow, or it'll pound the, the ceiling or pound the door. There was one case when I was outside and I was having a, a very interesting set of thoughts and the wind blew the door open and this huge freaking noise. And Another very, very strange Michaelism was that I got a chainsaw, steel uh, 151, model 151, which is a small one, because you don't want the big one. And uh, I got the pants and I got the helmet and all that. And I was saying, okay, the first thing I want to do is chop down these three trees with my chainsaw. That night, there was this outrageous windstorm. This was earlier in the year. And I go out the next day and two of the three trees have been broken in half by the wind. After I said, I want to cut those three trees down. And by breaking in half, it made it a lot safer. So wind is clearly one of the things that, that is the most powerful. And we'll see that in a second, but then also water. So this is a very, this was the one that really, really freaking blew my doors off. Okay, because it already been happening over and over again. And another one is the Archangel Michael light. I have this particular light switch that is intermittent. 
Sometimes it's on, sometimes it's off. And uh, no, somebody says his name is Val, not Valiant. Well, it's, it's Valiant. He does say that his name is Valiant. If you go actually read the book, he calls himself Val or Valiant, okay? Either one. So here I am in the bathtub, which I'm supposed to be in every day. I'm doing my thing. I got the pineal gland oils. I got the, but there's a little bit of water on my finger. So I left a little bit of water on the touchpad and I just touched it. I touch it, I sit back, and on its own, let's go back to the slide. This is, it, it literally was the most outrageous. It very, very quickly by itself scrolled from page 18 to page 28, just like, and it didn't do it kind of like it was slow and then it sped up and then it slowed down again. It was very fast and it did it all at one speed. It just went, and it's done. And the whole entire book scrolled to page 28 from page 18. And this is the exact moment where Valiant meets the President of the United States. And again, going back to the previous slide, it caused me to completely lose it. I mean, I just, it was such an all-defining moment in light of all the other things I was learning, in light of realizing that some very bad dreams I had as a kid might not be dreams, that... Uh, some some very sick people brought me into a program because of my intelligence and tortured me. Um, and But on the other hand, I got a high IQ out of the deal. So there you go. I'm happy to use it for the betterment of humanity if possible. So let's talk about this moment where Valiant meets POTUS because that's what they wanted me to read. So this is where it scrolled to, and this is what I read as I'm now sitting there in terror and tears about how in the world did this happen. It says... Suddenly the door opened, and six armed guards led Val to what appeared to be an elevator. Now, it always says Vi, because I think that the, the uh, optical character recognition assumed that this is talking about Steve Vi. So when you go read the online PDF, it always says Vi, but it means Val. It's just that it interpreted the L as an I. Okay, that's what's going on here. Suddenly the door opened, and six armed guards led Val to what appeared to be an elevator. It went rapidly to the bottom-most level. Maximum security was in place. After transferring to an underground train, they sped toward the White House. Six officials, six armed guards, and three Secret Service men escorted him into the office of President Eisenhower. Wow. From behind the desk, the President rose while the Secret Service men remained nervous and uneasy. As he extended his hand to shake that of the president, the Secret Service men drew their revolvers and pointed them at Val. That's pretty rude. Following the nod of the president, they reluctantly lowered their guns. Standing in front of his desk, the president said, Of course, you know we have suspended all rules of protocol. I have a good feeling toward you. Please, sir, what is your name? He replied, Valiant. Oh, and then, and then where do you come from? I come from the planet your Bible calls the morning and the evening star, Venus. Yes, sir. Can you prove this, he asked. Well, what do you constitute as proof? The president quickly retorted, well, I don't know. And then Valiant says, well, will you come with me to my ship? I'll give you a ride. The president answered with a quizzical look and said, my friend, I'm not allowed to come and go as I please. There are others to be considered, committees to be consulted, security measures to be adhered to. Please spend some time with us here. Let's get better acquainted and learn more about one another. So this is, the, this is the full page. It's Valiant meeting the president. And again, I believe the reason this was shown to me was to emphasize that the plan that we're seeing now had this archangelic, divine, Christian support. If you read Stranger at the Pentagon, Valiant Thor always wants to talk about Christ. You cannot get him to stop talking about it. He loves Jesus. <laughs> he loves everything about it. And so... That was very strange to these people because why would this human-looking entity show up who's, who's so into Jesus, okay? Well, I, uh, I certainly did not expect that I was going to end up crying today or telling you about traumatic abuse memories, but it happened, uh, and we just go with it. So I, I think I've pretty much gotten over it now. If these horrible things did happen to me, I'm glad that they're not happening anymore, and I'm glad that I am free now. And that's really the key of what we're about to see. I am free now. This is amazing what happened to me. 
So as I go through this Valiant Thor thing and the book is, is scrolling on its own, again, I cried for probably 10 or 15 minutes, just heaving frickin' insanity. Insane crying because you cannot tell me that scrolling right to the moment where Valiant met the President of the United States is some random coincidence that the laptop just did this on its own. Oh, it's just because of the drop of water and it electromagnetically interacted. Well, why didn't it electromagnetically interact right away? Why did I go back and the water was already there and then it goes, it scrolls exactly 10 pages very quickly and then it stopped? You can think that it's crap. You can think that I'm making this up. I know what happened. I know that I cried for 15 minutes. I know that it scared the crap out of me. It really did. And, I, and, and at the time that I did the interview with Mike, that people really love, again, go to his site, as I've said earlier in the show, and look up that interview that I did with him recently, because I talk about the executive function thing. And Trump just got another hole in one, so it's proven that it's continuing to happen. And I'll tell you, it's happening like crazy over here. But there was one that was very, very, very amazing, and I really wanted to talk about it before we had a chance to uh, be done here. So again, I end up looking for the introduction to Michael Prophecies and then thought that it was in 1998 and I couldn't find it because I knew there was a place where Michael introduced himself and said some really beautiful things and I found it in 1997. I think I first started looking in November, December of 97 and then I went back to January and I did January, February, March, April and then I got into May and the time loop kind of wore off and Michael basically told me, yeah, this particular time loop kind of went through those parts of 97. Now, there, there's other stuff. I'm seeing that everything is time looped now, and so I'm not allowed to read past May yet. I got to get this book done first. There's other stuff in there that I'm sure is going to be exciting, and I'm probably going to have to do multiple volumes because now I've realized there's a lot of great Archangel Michael slash Valiant Thor slash Law of One stuff that I received that is very pertinent to what's going on right now. The 1997 time loop was amazing because not only did it validate that apparently I was a member of the secret space program and I did go through traumatic abuse, but that I also have now cleared all of my karmic debt. That from past lives, from present lives, whatever the heck is going on, I have arrived at this point today where unless I was to create big new karma, I have basically cleared my karma. And that is so exciting. And it also means that because I have fought for humanity's freedom and fought for humanity's future, that even though I may have been forced to participate in horrible things in the past, I no longer have any karmic debt for having done that. I exonerated myself with the universe by being a hero stepping forward and doing the right thing to save this planet and to save all life on this planet, or at least as much of it as we can save. So it's a huge deal to me to get a time loop where the words are very clearly talking about what's going on in the present. And again, it's astonishing redundancy. I've d discussed time loops many other times, and there's no getting around it. There's no, no way that this could be anything other than something that knows what's going on in my life now telling me about it in 1997. So then, at this point, this is where the story gets really amazing. The time loop tells me that my life is going to change, that I'm about to have a very interesting new life, and I think you are too. And that life, they, they knew all about the fact that I was going to be doing this aerospace company. They knew all about the fact that I was going to be making hover cars, spaceships, free energy, anti-gravity, all that stuff is in there. And in the time loop, they say that the way that our world will change and how fast it will change is much more than we could have imagined. So it's, it's a very, very exciting timeline for our future. So at this point, uh, reflecting on the fact that I may have been ritually abused, it certainly appears like it. I've had these very bad dreams of things happening to me all my life. I've felt like I'm on fire. I could never understand why I felt like I wanted other people to abuse me, why I felt like I deserved to be abused, why I felt like I deserved to be tortured, why I felt like, yeah, go ahead, hit, hit me, you know, the equivalent. I mean, I'm talking about business deals. I'm talking about many things that have happened to me all throughout my life and people who got together into my life in various capacities and created a lot of harm. 
And it wasn't until Elizabeth came along that she shut the door on that and taught me how to protect myself. And I thank her so much for teaching me boundaries. So only now is it clear that by having the healthy boundaries, by not allowing psychopaths in, by not feeling subconsciously as if I deserve abuse and therefore I need to attract in the abuse to balance out whatever the hell I had to sit through and watch. I mean, it's coming back to me, folks. And this is, this is significant. My therapist has said that everything that's happening to me is consistent with the recovery of traumatic memories, okay? And I don't want to be that person. I don't want to have ever have to go through this again. I don't want to be brought into anything where I'd ever have to see anything like this again. Absolutely not. And I want this evil to be freed from the planet Earth. I do not want anybody to have to go through this stuff. It's just horrible. So I was very emotional. The Michael thing had happened. He scrolled 10 pages. It freaked me out. But then I'm looking at the time loop. And what is the time loop saying? It's saying to me, David, you are free now. You do not need to be punished anymore. You do not need to be tortured anymore. You do not need to feel guilty anymore. You do not need to feel ashamed anymore. You have done enough to work off the, the, the events that occurred in your past in this and other parallel lifetimes. Because that's how they really look at it as a parallel lifetime when you have this kind of thing going on. So I became very emotional because my whole life I felt as if I'm, I'm bad. I've done something wrong and I feel like I'm on fire. And until the world is fixed, I cannot feel good. Until I can fix the world, I cannot rest. I cannot look at myself in the mirror and feel good about myself at all. I must fight. I must get this thing solved. And I must get rid of these parasites that have infested our solar system. And they're real. Okay, so all of this led up to me going into the mountains and making this prayer based upon everything that Michael had been telling me that I have discharged my karma and that I don't need to be experiencing suffering, pain. I mean, we all are. We're all experiencing horrible, horrible things right now in the world. And apparently this is not going to last much longer. It's not just my karma that's being cleared, folks. It's Earth's karma. It's whether we need to have these jerks continue to misrepresent us and lie to us and steal our money and leave us for dead or actually kill us. Okay, that's coming to an end. And so I go out into the mountains and I'm now aware that, okay, an authenticated, time-looped, 1997 divine source is telling me that I am free and clear. I am karmically free and clear and I am going to claim that. I am not going to let this go. So I go out into the mountains and as I'm making this prayer that confirms that I have gotten through the worst of my karma, that I won't need to have any type of extreme negativity in my life again. The wind surges up into this incredible 75 mile an hour fury. I mean, it was so intense that I literally had to sit down on the wind, put my arms out and sit down on it because it was pushing against me so hard that I was afraid I would fall if I didn't lean back against the wind, okay? Now, as this point, as this is going on, uh, and let's go back here. The prayer concluded with, and I'll say it, I'll say it in the hero voice because this, this is the way that I did it. Okay. This is the way that it actually happened. Cause what, what, what I'm about to tell you is the most phenomenal thing that's ever happened to me in my entire life. And it was telekinesis, big telekinesis. Okay. So I'm just going to set that up so you can wait for this. By decree of Archangel Michael, I am free now. That's the way I did it, okay? It was something equivalent to that. By decree of Archangel Michael, I am free now. Now, as I, even as I said this sentence, folks, right as I'm saying this sentence, the wind got even more outrageous, okay? And I knew that this 1997 time loop meant that, that by being a hero, by fighting for freedom, I've cleared this karma, whatever the hell happened to me before, whatever liability karmically might have been, even though I was forced, none of this was my choice, okay? I cleared it. 
I say by decree of Archangel Michael, I am free now. And at the exact moment that I said, I am free now, the, in, the entire flow of 75 mile an hour wind came to a complete and sudden stop. It literally, it was like, it's so intense that I'm leaning back and going, oh my God, oh my God, I am free now. Wham! It just stopped. I mean, all the wind stopped. There's no noise. I don't hear wind. I'm not feeling it. I can stand up. It all stopped. And, and I'm telling you, the violence of the wind leading up to this moment was so intense for minutes and minutes and minutes. And right at the exact second that I said, I am free now, it stopped dead. This is not the end of the story, folks. As I, as I suddenly realized what happened, as I suddenly realized what happened, and the gravity, literally the gravity that would be involved in making something like this happen, causing a 75 mile an hour wind to stop dead, that's a lot more pounds of pressure per square inch than it takes to levitate a human body. A human body, in my case, let's say 180 pounds, levitating that, versus stopping a 75 mile an hour wind dead in its tracks so that there's absolutely no sound at all, that's more than 180 pounds. That's a lot more than it would take to make me levitate. And in the time loop, Michael is saying that we all have much more powerful abilities than we realize, and it's our fourth dimensional self that's choosing not to let us use it yet. But in order to be able to use it, you have to do things like, you know, get your muscles worked out, decalcify your pineal gland. We'll talk about all that in Ascension Philosophy coming up. So again, the point was that after the wind stopped and I'm standing there going, oh my God, I can't believe this just happened. There, it's, it, it, it's the, it was the purest, the cleanest, the most beautiful moment of God consciousness the, the knowingness, it's going to happen again. I'm sorry. I don't, want to, I don't want to cry again, but it was so beautiful. It was so amazing. It was so life-altering. I prayed, and I got the answer. And it means that I'm okay. And it means that I'm free. And it means that you are free. And these people are leaving. This was an event that happened to me for the planet. It didn't happen just for me. It happened for the planet. It's a prophetic vision of where we are. So as I have this thing happen, and I realize the wind has just stopped, the next thing that happens is this energy comes up from my feet. It comes up from the bottom of my feet. It goes up to the top of my head. And uh, it, was like, it was like the equivalent of what they call in Hinduism, Shaktipat. And this is where you go to a guru and he or she puts their hands near you or, or sometimes they don't even need to be that close, but they hit you with something and you go into this blissful consciousness. And I had it myself, if you read my latest book, Awakening the Dream, when the shaman was on stage in my senior year of college, she was from Siberia. And she was throwing her voice off the back of the room. And I closed my eyes and tried to meditate with her. And all of a sudden, I couldn't breathe. And I'm gasping for breath, but I can't breathe. And then my mind got thrown into this weird domain where I had access to all information. And any question that I asked, I got the answer. And I was seeing something that looked like a galaxy, but more like a three-dimensional spiral. If you see galaxies kind of going like this. Well, that energy was alive and it was conscious and it loved me and it loved my life and what I was doing. And I answered, I got three questions answered immediately. And then I came back and all of a sudden I could breathe. <gasps> and as I inhaled like this, she's standing on the edge of the stage going, it was the scariest freaking thing, folks. I mean, up until that point in my life, she's looking right at me and she did this. And I was like, oh my God, she did this. That was a Shakti pot. It was a bad one because you couldn't breathe and you felt like you were dying, but she got me into that realm of death, okay, for just a little bit. And so in this case, there was no lack of breathing. It was just ecstasy. So the ecstasy happened in a very interesting way because it also had a sound. Um, it's hard to explain what this actually was. I'm going to try. 
Um, I mean, there, there is a verbalization. So let me just give you the verbalization. The verbal is it was as if, okay. It was as if I was an egg of liquid. Like my soul was this egg. And the, the ripple came up from the bottom, went through the egg, went up to the top, and then rippled back down. I could feel the egg. It was as if it was the surface of my skin. It was as if it was me. I felt the entire egg. I felt the energy moving up through the egg, but more importantly was that the energy movement was total ecstatic energy, total bliss. Orgasmic times a thousand. Orgasm doesn't begin to cover what this was like. It was much better. And it was so pure. It was the knowledge that I am not alone and that the Creator exists, and He just stopped the wind for me. It was so incredible. And so the sound, as the, as, the, as the ripple went through, it went, boom. That's the sound that I heard. I felt it more than heard it, but the boom. I guess that's the best way to describe what it sounded like. So this was very intense. Uh, the Shakti Pot experience no longer made me afraid of telekinesis. Since this wind stopped and I got the, the bowl thing, um, I have uh, continued to have telekinesis. It, it, it stopped for a little while. I was going through a very stressful phase a couple weeks ago, um, just dealing with a lot of administrative things. And our company, we've, we've had people lying to us. We've, we're trying to get money. We're, we're very, very... We, we, we really... It's kind of amazing that we're going to be able to buy the facility because we've had to delay the transaction so many times. But now we're getting down to due diligence and we just need an appraisal and then our lender can fund. So hopefully the hover car company is going to fund this week, this coming week, we, we hope. Um, but I have literally, I'm not kidding when I say that my fear over not only the loss of my entire investment, which is all the money I've earned and made in my life really, but not only that, but also the loss of the dream, the loss of the hover cars, the loss of the power plants, the loss of this even being possible. I'm so invested in making this company for you. I want you to have an affordable hover car that I'm having insomnia when we can't get the money. I'm, I'm not able to sleep. I've had panic attacks. I've had anxiety. And now in the last couple of weeks, we've started to have meetings in D.C. We're starting to get movement on our firefighting aircraft, which is $60 million less and the comparable firefighting aircraft C-130 design. So you save 60 million bucks a plane. So it looks like the company is moving forward. It looks like we're not going to collapse. It looks like we're not going to lose the building. But this has been just driving me insane, folks. And so I have been very traumatized, feeling alone, feeling isolated, living in this house by myself, nobody else you know, around but the dog. I'm not going to get into another relationship right away. I've, that's, that's clear. Uh, I mean, I will probably in the future, but I needed this time to just be by myself, to figure out who I am, figure out what my life is. What am I doing here? Do I want to live in this house alone forever, spend my money and just save it all up and, and just eat food and do nothing? And the answer is absolutely not. So when Archangel Michael stopped the wind, I will never be the same person. And you can again deny that this happened. You can tell me that I'm full of it, that I'm lying to you, that I'm trying to make this up for money or whatever. <laughs> That's not true. I haven't done anything to make money this year so far. Um, and I probably won't need to if, if I get, you know, if, if our company gets financed. But again, I have to do one more paid product in the meantime to stabilize myself. So we are going to do that. But uh, I shared this with the Alliance. I shared the wind stopping and the, and the enormous amount of gravitational pressure that would have been required to cause this to happen, which is much greater than what it would take to levitate one person, which means obviously the ability is inside me now. If I had the ability to do this, to answer in my prayer like this, it means that that ability exists. So that's actually very exciting. So I've been sharing all the telekinesis that's happening to me with the Alliance. I think they've been very interested in this too. Uh, and so one of my insiders is, I, I call him the Colonel. So the Colonel uh, actually thought of Revelation 7. And this is what made me realize 
that what happened to me is probably meant to be for everyone. It wasn't just something that was happening to me to let me know that I am free now. I don't have any residual karma. I don't have to feel like I need to be tortured or that I have this sense that I'm a bad person inside or something. I've figured out why all that happened. And I have fought my ass off for the good and to try to make this planet better, okay? So the Colonel says, whoa, David, you just got something that's right out of Revelation 7 with all the wind stopping like that? Oh yeah, go back and take a look. So I did. Here's what, here's what it says, okay? It's very interesting. I saw four angels. I saw four angels. Of course, Gabriel, Raphael, Ariel, and Mikael. Mikael is Michael, right? So Archangel Michael is one of the four angels. So first of all, he actually did an event by stopping the wind that refers to a passage in the Bible where he is one of the four archangels that actually stops the wind. Hmm, interesting. I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, one of which is Michael, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. And holding is interpreted as holding back the winds. So, wow. Okay, so what? That, this makes it a prophetic event, right? Let's read the rest of this passage, okay? And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth back, that the wind should not blow on the earth. So this is some kind of biblical prophecy they gave me, folks. Nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Their foreheads? Well, what happens with psychopaths? Psychopaths don't have MRI activity in the forehead. And I really do believe, and we'll get into this more in the next show, that the psychopath is the mark of the beast. If your brain isn't operating up here, you have the mark of the beast. Okay? So to activate the seal means that your pineal gland is activated. Jesus in the book of Mark says the light of the body is the eye. If your eye be single, single? I got two eyes. What are you talking about, Jesus? If your eye be single, your whole body will be full of light. Now, this is not the Illuminati one eye thing at all. We're talking about the pineal gland. Jesus is telling you in the book of Mark to activate your pineal gland. Okay, that's part of the magic. So now, Archangel Michael slash Valiant Thor slash Law of One has come in, stopped the wind, just like Revelation 7. And in the messages that correlated with all this, he's telling me the earth is not going to be destroyed. You're not going to have the solar flash. You're not going to have the pole shift, at least not right away. So then getting back to this, it says, these angels will not hurt the earth, the sea, or the trees until they have received the seal in their forehead. So this, to me, probably represents the opening of the pineal gland. The seal ultimately represents the bright pineal gland, where you have telekinesis, where you have telepathy, and these abilities exist. And so there is a line in the Law of One where it says something about a 100 to 700 year time frame before the possibility of a solar flash. So I've started, the last I was at, in the last videos I spoke, before this time loop and before Michael stopped the wind, I was like, well, maybe the solar flash just is canceled and it's not going to happen at all because it looks like it happened on Proxima Centauri right on December 21st, 2012, the exact day that the mind calendar ended. Bam! We got the 2012 solar flash. So maybe it's not going to happen here. Eh, it probably is still going to happen, but it's going to take 100 to 700 years and... Everybody's going to be getting executive function. Everybody's going to be getting telekinesis. Everybody's going to start becoming aware that you have this spiritual double 
that is trying to get your attention with synchronicity, with telepathy, moving things around on you, all that kind of stuff. So I'm having to go through this first to get ready for everybody else dealing with this. And again, they did tell me that this, these abilities of executive function will start happening much more often after the cabal has been arrested and exposed, which is going to take a while. When we get into the next class, and I'm going to talk about the solar cycles and how that's working, it's going to be a couple more years, but the bulk of it, I think, is going to be over before the end of this year. The bulk of the most kinetic stuff, which is why I doubt that we have to wait until November to see some really big stuff. Because again, France shows you're not going to solve this by voting, right? So uh, I think that what's going to happen is that over the next 100 to 700 years, that this other aspect of ourselves will become awake. We will learn how to bilocate into it. We will learn how to use it to move objects. We will learn how to use it to make our bodies levitate. And once enough of us, or once all of us, have figured this out and we all have this going, then the sun does its thing, but nobody really cares because you're now able to live in the new body that you built over the last 100 to 700 years. And so that's where I think most likely that this is actually going based on everything I'm getting from Michael in real time here. So he says that this solar flash won't happen until we're ready for it, where your 4D body is fully activated and it's useful. Therefore, it is an effortless transformation. And as I said, the repetition of the number seven in this system is talking about your chakras. It's talking about all that stuff. So... Let me just uh, cut down here a little bit more because I want to, uh... okay, let's do this. You got you to gotta have a slideshow that you can adapt for the length of the show that you want to do. And I'm already more than I wanted to be in time. So what is it now? Three and a half hours, but then half an hour gone away. It's basically three hours minus the however long it took me to get back online. <laughs> so we have an expectation that we're going to be getting a lot of advanced technology. This is very, very intrinsic to the whole concept of fourth density activation. And as I said, our top insiders are now being told mind-blowing things. In other words, people who I know as insiders have told me that they've been told very amazing things and they, they haven't even told me what they are yet. I don't know what the very amazing things are, but I'm getting that the, the arrests are going to be amazing. The trial is going to be amazing. It's not going to be very long. And you're going to find out a, a whole lot of weird stuff almost immediately. So we're getting rapid movements toward full disclosure. They're now giving us the order to zero in on this. So let's finish Revelation 7 here. I heard the number of them who were sealed, and it was 144,000. And here's the... 12 tribes of Israel. So again, this is one of those things that is metaphorical, not really literal. So uh, don't get hung up on the, the 12 lost tribes and all this stuff. This is all metaphorical. The book of Revelation was achieved in a dream state, and a lot of it is symbolic. So don't assume that if you're not one of these tribes that you're not going, or don't assume that there's only 144,000 people. This is all very, very much a symbolic message. I could go much more into that, but I'm not going to right now. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, and people and tongues. So the whole world is now standing before the throne and before the Lamb. This is Jesus, of course, the Logos, the galactic mind. They are now clothed in their white robes and they have palms in their hands. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, about the elders, and the four beasts fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, honor, power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, you already know. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
the shedding of the innocents, right? Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. So this is a very important point here because again, remember, Archangel Michael specifically used the stopping of the wind to tell us to read Revelation 7. And right here it says that we are coming out of great tribulation and we have washed our robes clean of the blood that was formed. The blood is all of the crazy stuff that they've been doing to us in third density. And I'm done with it. I'm done with, with you know, shedding blood and being victimized. It's not going to happen, okay? So back to the slide again. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, because your fourth density body is energy, nor any heat, just like the Valiant Thor people, right? That's what's going to happen. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them to living fountains of water, like the fountain of youth, right? Eternal life. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is obviously very, very exciting, very, very amazing. And to me, this prophecy is not an accident. Again, you can deny it, but I will never be the same after having the wind stopped when I said, by decree of Archangel Michael, I am free now. And when I said I am free now, that means I don't need to suffer anymore. That means I don't need to be tortured. That means I don't need to go through horrible things. And hopefully the company will get financed too. You know, let's add that on there, you know, if you're making a wish list. It's really bothered me. I mean, I've had very bad insomnia. I've needed to uh, take sleep medication sometimes, actually, because I just can't sleep. I'll wait. This has been happening over and over again. I wake up at like 1 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning, and I just can't get back to sleep. A lot of times I've been passing out on the couch, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. I, I want to listen to the news. I'm trying to listen to the shows that I like, and I just immediately pass out. So... There's very intense energetics going on through me and in my life. They want me up here alone in this house. I'm not, I'm not actually unhappy anymore. I was unhappy for quite a while. I was very unhappy in January, February, March, and April, okay? Uh, and I needed that time because I don't want unhappiness to project into my work. I wanted my work to be clean and clear. I wanted to come from the highest possible level. And I wanted to come to you with positivity not projecting anything, being very clear about what I'm seeing and where this is going. And then when you start getting the time loop and you, and you start recovering traumatic memories and you're remembering those things as if they happened to you, you have to take time to process. Again, I think I'm pretty much done with it. I think I'm pretty much done with the processing. I've accepted that this may have happened to me, though I have no absolute memory or way of proving that it did. Uh, that may come in the future. I have been told that it will be made available to me that the memory block could be removed. I don't know if I want the memory block removed because honestly, it may be that there's 30 or 40 different ceremonies I had to see. And I don't want to remember those. Um, it would be nice if I could get preferential memories of some things and not others, but I don't know if it works that way. And he, I've also been hearing that there's probably very good records and therefore whatever was done would be something that I could learn. Yeah, I don't really want to find out that I have another lifetime, sort of like a parallel lifetime that was dark. Um, I just want to fight against it. I don't really need to know what happened. I don't really want to know it. I don't really think I need those memories unblocked. Uh, I just want to go into space now on much friendlier terms. Let's build the spaceships now. Let's get out there now. And they're telling us that this is going to move a lot faster than we thought. So I am very, very pleased now to say that we are at the end of the show. I'm going to go into the solar cycles in the next episode. I'm sorry I didn't have time to get into this today. But obviously this other stuff took precedence and I just go with the flow. Um, again, I'm sorry for the emotionality. These are, in my experience, real traumatic memories that I've had to process and release. Hence the bathtub uh, has been very helpful. Uh, when you're in the bathtub, there's a lot of baptism type of stuff that happens. There's a lot of, And baptism is a big deal. Okay, baptism really works. And I don't know why you got to urinate in the water, but that's just part of It's up to you whether you want to try that part or not, but they're telling me it's very much part of the protocol. So what do we got ahead in the coming weeks? 
probably a blackout, probably big, crazy, weird stuff, probably scary stuff. It could get a lot worse. I don't know. I don't know if it's all going to roll up this week. I don't know if it's going to take weeks more. But when you see how desperate they are, when you go through that checklist that we had earlier in the show, in fact, let's just go back to that checklist again because I have the ability to pop around, of course. And let's just think about this because now that we're now that we're at the end, we start at the beginning once more. So again, we've got this cr crash that's going on, this crazy situation with crypto, with Netflix apparently coming up with housing soon enough. We've got this fuel supply terrifying issue with Europe. It's, it's, it's literally death if this isn't solved like immediately. So this is a very big deal. The Twitter thing is important. The horses are incredibly important because, again, it could be as little as seven days before somebody acts on this with criminal arrests, okay? It could, could be this week. The Roe thing came out, obviously distraction. What happened in New York last night? Same thing, seems to be. Deutsche Bank is huge. The Fed thing is huge. And again, the overthrow of Xi Jinping. So all of this stuff really, really has everything to do with what's going on now and why we have to be so vigilant. So let me get back to just like Vigilant Thor or Valiant Thor, right? You got Vigilant too. <laughs> okay, so let's now go into our global peace meditation. If I can find the right button. Because I don't want to keep talking and I've already been... Oh, Randy Cooper says, hurry, I have to clean my dishes. Okay. Uh, well, well, we'll speed it up just for you, Randy. How about that? Okay. So, uh, don't freak out about all the stuff that I just put in the list. This is what happens when you're at the end of something that people don't really see what it is yet. If you have a revolution, that kind of thing, you don't really find out about it until it actually happens unless you're very astute and you can see the signs coming. But a lot of times these things happen spontaneously and for most people they're a huge surprise as one administration suddenly turns into something else, okay? It, it can often be a huge surprise. A lot of people are not seeing where this is going. You probably are because you're studying the same kind of data that I am. And we can help activate that timeline that we want right now. So let's do that together. Are you ready? So I'd like you to begin by placing both feet flat on the floor and just let yourself breathe deeply, becoming more and more relaxed. Relaxation moving through your body, through every cell of your body. Filling with beautiful light. The colors, the sounds of consciousness entering into your mind. The fulfillment of the promise. The fullness of the actualization of what it is that you've always wanted to be in the world that you have always wanted to live in. Now, everything is changing. We can invoke the virginal mind, step away from the staggering contradictions of what we are seeing now, and step into the faith and the trust and the peace of where this is going, where our planet is taking us. By decree of Archangel Michael, we are free now. This is his demand for the entirety of planet Earth. And he stopped the winds to underline the lesson. Do not be afraid of what you are seeing take place in the world today. It is not the end. It is merely the last vestiges of a dying world order that secured control through deception, theft, murder, lies, and betrayal. We no longer need this type of experience on Earth 
to mirror our collective karma back to ourselves. By decree of Archangel Michael, we are free now, and we are moving back into the purity that we once were, the purity that can redefine our existence as we learn to take our lessons and accept that the universe is love. It is a loving consciousness, and we are here to learn to love one another. And these epic villains are only there to trigger the Great Awakening. For where we go one, we go all. And so it is. Now I'd like you to breathe your way back into the room, wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes. Come on back with me now. Thank you for participating in this meditation. Thank you for being here with me in this show. I'm uh, sorry that I cried, but it didn't seem like you guys were that upset about it. This is a very exciting week. Uh, I do want to pop in more. I'm going to be very much focused on getting that Archangel Michael book out to you and getting the Ascension Philosophy course outlined, written up, and launched. Maybe we can start the course really soon, maybe in a week or two. I, you know, um, I got to give it a little bit of time before we uh, actually start the show so that people can find out about it and that they have a chance to order it, but it's only going to be a few weeks. So Ascension Philosophy, I'm going to get way more into the executive function teachings that I've been given about the inversion of the, of the mind's eye into the environment, uh, more exercises, a lot more stuff is coming in that course. And again, Michael Prophecies, we're going to be releasing it on thedisclosure.com. I will have it available in an audiobook format. In fact, I even have a nice little lower third here if I can find it. No, it's gone. Okay, that's never mind. I, I had to reopen the thing. So anyway, that's all the time that we have for today. Um, don't be afraid in the next coming days because I'm expecting very, very, very big things to be happening. The best thing I can advise you to do is to meditate, to breathe. Don't act like everything is so important. Just be good to yourself. Take some time off. Take a bath if you need to. Don't feel like you got to be so busy. Don't feel like you got to study all the news. Don't let your mind get all riled up. Sleep when you can. If you're having insomnia, sleep when you can. And keep on using the power of prayer because that is the calling. The biggest thing that these angelic beings need is they need you to actually pray to them. Because the law of one makes it very clear that unless you do, they cannot act. Therefore, the more of us who ask for help, the faster we're going to get through this. Your vote counts because each additional person voting in favor of light and love adds exponentially to the size of the calling and they calculate what they can do based on the size of the calling. That means that even a few people multiply into a very, very significant effect. So if I have done one thing today, maybe I have built your faith to get you to be a little bit more confident about what's going on, to be a little more prayerful and meditative in your daily life, and to learn most of all to just be kind to yourself. You don't need to feel so bad about everything. You don't need to feel like you're a bad person. You don't need to feel like you're someone who deserves to be abused because that's what the, that's what the deep state is showing you. And again, I was trained in this in college. I was trained in domestic violence. I was trained in perpetrators. I studied this academically, so I know a lot more about this than usual. And when the person starts hitting, it's because they're losing control and they, and they are afraid and they are trying to maintain their grip on power. And what we're seeing right now is the equivalent of them hitting us. This is where it comes to an end because the human population has decided we don't like being hit. We like to fight back, and we are fighting back. And this is where it's going. And I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my information, to listen to what I have to tell you. Even if you can't believe everything that I said is true, I think you will be greatly, greatly surprised by the quality and the depth of the Michael prophecies. So please, again, go to thedisclosure.com. I'm going to try to get the darn thing recorded as an audio book this coming week, but first I got to get the interpretations written. And I was going to do it now, but then I said, wait a minute, things are so crazy, I've got to squeak out a video before I make the product. 
So hopefully I'll get this product done in the coming week. Hopefully I'll be back with you on a video very soon to launch the product because the product launch is going to be several videos. That's going to be a lot of fun. I've got tons of slides I haven't even gone through. We're going to talk about solar cycles. Many more things are coming up. Sorry that it ended up being, I don't know, three hours plus once again. But this is David Wilcock. I love you. I'm not suicidal, okay? I'm having a great time. I've been through the bad stuff. I've actually, I'm feeling great now. I'm enjoying being alone. I'm enjoying the meditation. I'm enjoying playing music. I'm enjoying doing this video. And I want to do more. I now feel a lot more comfortable about this. And I want to get on the camera and I want to use this talent that I have to help you. So with that said, I'm David Wilcock signing off. We will see you next time. Thank you for watching. And may the light and love of the one infinite creator be with you. When does he hit stop?